Thank you to Motionless in White for Disguise, one of the themes for the Mortal Kombat Pro Competition stop at Combo Breaker 2019. Good morning, everybody, if you're in North America. If you're somewhere else, then hello. My name is Ketchup, and I'm joined by Darth Armour on the commentary desk for Combo Breaker 2019, where now it's top 24. This is where the games get really serious. This is where the games get really good. I mean, we're seeing the best of the best, and if you guys want to follow along at home, you guys can go to smash.gg, look for Combo Breaker, here, Mortal Kombat 11, but let's run down who's still in it. We have eight guys still in the winner's bracket, and the remaining 16 players are going to be in the loser's bracket. So we have Scar, Waz, Gur, a Foxy Grandpa, Tweety, Sonic Fox, Hayate, and Samij all in winners. Now, out of all those names, do you really feel like there's any big surprises or big upsets that got in there? For me, honestly, no. I mean, most of those players were at the Summit, and uh, the Summit recently, you know, I've said it before and I'll say it again, it pretty much was a four-day boot camp for everyone involved. The players just used it as a, uh, a perfect opportunity to level up and get ready for the first stop in the pro competition, which is Combo Breaker 2019. Let's not forget, right, the pro competition is a world circuit where different majors around the world have pro competition status. This is the first one that has the really prestigious event. $15,000 on the line, $5,000 for first place. And wow, hang on a minute. The first game on stream, my brother, PND Mustard, who is uh, in the loser's bracket, and he's going to be facing off against combat. Now, these guys have never played offline. I think they played once online, and it was day one. So uh, what to make from this? I'm really not sure. Uh, combat has gone strength to strength, won a bunch of local tournaments. And Mustard has actually done very, uh, very, very well in both the United Kingdom tournaments and today. You know, he did not expect to get top 24 in this tournament at all, but the Kano's been pulling through. I believe Mustard and Biohazard are the only two Kano's left in this competition. And no matter what happens, man, I'm proud of my proud of my bro for getting this far. Uh, you should be. You should be because it is quite an accomplishment. But both these players so talented and have had so much success in the past. This game's not even a month old, a little bit more than a month old. And, you know, combat, back-to-back -back local wins this week. He is on fire right now. Let's see if Mustard can douse that fire at all or if he's just going to fall victim to combat. Uh, combat's many characters, so it looks like here we oh, don't have a button check. We're going into it. This is definitely it. You can tell after so many years of seeing this. And combat's going with uh, with, with Baraka. Now, this is a matchup that Mustard knows really well, but uh, it's going to come down to player skill at the end of the day. Mustard now immediately uh, caught by the launch, and there it is. That patient Kano ball, just neutral jump. I love that extended range, and Mustard falling for a hook, line and sinker. One thing Mustard will always do with Kano is he'll sit there full screen, he'll jump, and the moment he sees you press a button, he'll go for the Kano ball. Mustard didn't amplify, kind of wanted the restand situation, but combat very intelligently using it against him. Round one, just like that. Man, I think this pick is very strong because this specific variation punishes very, very, very hard. That once that gutted crushing blow happens, it's a lot of damage that's just off the table and off your opponent's life bar. That's such a tricky thing with, with this variation of Baraka where he's got the extended range where you try and trip guard a neutral jumping Baraka and then the increased range just blows you up. Kano's down one into his back one. A nice little uh, check there. Not the best mid in the game, but point blank, it's exceptionally fast. And there is down one again, forcing his turn. Down one, turn steal, throw escape from Mustard, and now it's going to be just a battle of pokes! Oh. And I love it. Using the minus frames to neutral duck, he knows he's going to try and high punish it. But here we go. Getting yeah. checked again, and here we, we see Mustard just kind of testing the water, seeing if he believes and will not get hit by that second hit of that string. I believe it's the 2-4 string. And, yep. and Combat right now is doing a good job of blocking, so that means that's going to open the opportunity for Mustard to go for those tick throws. A down two, beautiful counter, and the roll through Fatal Blow. That is the online ranked classic, but hey, at any level it's going to work because of that armor. I mean, it was a big risk to take, but it was a risk that pays off. You know, normally the wake-up roll into Fatal Blow, there's a reason you see it so constantly, because when someone does a roll and the opponent doesn't press a button, um, the first thing the opponent's going to probably try and do is, hey, you've gone in for the roll. I'm now going to try and press it and take my turn. And exactly. the Fatal Blow, it's a turn stealer. It's it's entirely a bait where the roll makes you press and the Fatal Blow is going to blow through it. Now, that wasn't a uh, exceptionally you know crazy one-sided match, but Combat looking extremely comfortable in the matchup, and the damage of Baraka is just off the chain. If you haven't got Breakaway, you're in so much trouble. Yeah, definitely. And, it, you know, just so much versatility here with, oh, my, the up, the wake up up to fast enough and launches into a full combo. Carrying him over to the corner. Great jump over by Mustard. And he goes for the tick throw, but gets down one for his trouble. There's that cane ball again. And he, again, I feel like one thing that Combat's doing is his defensive reads have been on point. If he down twos, it works out. Mustard going in for the jump three. I assume he read a jump there. Instant jump one. We see that all the time. But a rare spurge of it not working. Mustard now is going to get knocked down in Combat. 
enforcing his offense, and yeah, there it is. I'm not going to dedicate the amplifier. fight. Oh, no, with Punishita. I think he expected the forward 4-4 four, four there. And he was, and oh man, here come, here comes the momentum. No, a big stop to that with that invulnerable up three from Baraka. And combat is on match point here. Mustard needs to kick it into high gear right now if he wants to remain in this tournament. He's going to get the first hit, but the thing is against Baraka in particular, going for command grabs can be a huge risk because if he hits one opening, it's, it's gutted damage. And now the breakaway has been used. Mustard's gonna have to make the almighty reads if he wants to go for command grabs in this situation. Combat, pressuring, no flawless block from Mustard, I wonder if that was the tempo or not. And again, on defense, Combat's reads have just been on point every time. And there's the knockdown. He's gonna spend more meter. Oh my god, 54% damage. And I think that's gonna be it for the boy. Mustard's gonna be out the tournament. But what a display there. Combat, how many characters does this guy play? He plays so many characters, it's hard to get a full read on him. He's been able to kind of test them in the highest of pressure situations. Again, like we said, this man is on fire, and I don't know who can possibly take him out. And that last play at the end just... It's so tough when you don't have that breakaway and that Baraka is just banging down that door of defense. If he gets that crushing blow with that down two like he did there, as we saw, his life bar just depleted. But we do have some replays for you as we can just take you through what happened here. It was pretty much a game of up close. That's why it was so fast because it's Baraka point blank. And the moment he opens you up, you know, I mean, the damage speaks for itself. But it normally did come down to those, all those crazy little moments where you just got to make the right call. You know, you know the situation, you know that maybe a down one's going to come, maybe a grab's going to be there, maybe it's going to be a mid, maybe it's going to be a jump in or something similar. There's, there are these little micro reads you have to make every time and every single exchange there, like, like even there, every t time there was an exchange, combat just made the right call. Like his decision making was just off the chain and Mustard's going to be unfortunately at the tournament, but I think he'll be the first person to say that he did not expect to, uh, to reach top 24, but had a bit of a loser's run after he lost to Scar in winners. We're going to see Scar now um, maintaining his rampage in the winner's bracket. And I believe this is actually a match for top eight. Yes, this is uh, this is on the, the winner's side. This is Waz going up against Scar. And uh, yeah, well, the winner of this will face the winner of Gur versus a Foxy Grandpa. Now, Waz, even though he was at the summit of time, I feel like you know his results don't speak to, 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 the, to the magnitude of the results of everyone else in this winner's side of uh, top 24. And today, completely different player than what I saw at Beyond the Summit. Completely different character, and he's he's just killing it. He is killing it. He is. I was talking to Waz at the Summit, actually, and he, you know, he was using Noob Cybot then, and he mentioned that he, he didn't really believe that Noob Cybot was the character for him, but the turnaround for the Summit from game launch was so fast that he didn't really have time to, to practice any other characters, so he kind of had to go with the character he knew for the time. After the summit, he messed around with Cabal a little bit, but eventually found his footing in Jade. Jade was a side character back at the summit, and now he's transitioned into a full-time Jade main. Um, and Jade fits Waz's style so much better. Waz is patient. Waz isn't afraid to play the clock. And he, he, he played like, he ran the, the clock like four times in a row, I'm pretty sure, yesterday at some point, or something crazy. Yes, yes. But then <laughs> Scar, it's going to be a completely polar opposite, you know, where uh, he is not afraid to be all out off and crazy rushdown. Uh, we're going to button check for now. And uh, I'm going to assume maybe we're going to see Jade versus Sonya. Uh, but we did see Cusco versus Waz yesterday, where Waz looked more than comfortable in that matchup. But Cusco and Scar, I believe it's going to be uh, two different beasts with the same character. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I mean, but it's Waz, Waz. And for those of you out there who are just kind of finding, you know, some frustrations with, you know, plateaus that you're, and hurdles that you just can't get over, sometimes just a fresh set of eyes or, you know, a brand new character, a character that you maybe didn't visit too hard before is all you really need. And look at Waz coming all the way from Australia and destroying everybody in his way. He's been the Australian Netherrealm champion for almost as long as, uh, I mean, since MKX for sure. And then, you know, Injustice 2 was exactly the same. I want to shame, man. I'm sure so many of you from Australia are watching right now. You know, shout outs to everyone tuning in from all different parts of the world. And the Australian Netherrealm scene is, it's not the largest scene in the world, but it's passionate. And it has passionate players. And that is where Waz has been born and bred. He's very calculated. And I love all the time he takes uh, to just relax and calm himself down. You know, shout out to Spuda in the background, traveling with him, good friends, and uh, cheering on his boy in person, the only one able to do it. But here we go, Jade. 
And that's actually Scorpion. So this must be a matchup thing. I imagine Scar was, does not want to play Sonya versus Jade because Jade's glow does beat that full screen neutral. Well, not only that, but a lot of people love having a pocket Scorpion to deal with those characters that want to stay at full screen, those characters that want to rely on zoning and playing the long game. So, so those of you don't know, but maybe you're just new to Mortal Kombat, Scorpion has access to a teleport that brings you right next to your opponent. And in this variation, he has the ability to either cancel it backwards before he goes to the other side or cancel it right next to his opponent at the cost of one defensive part. Yeah, I mean, Reborn's a great variation for those that want to be unpredictable because the big thing about canceling it, right, is that you don't have to dedicate these hard decisions. Normally, teleport is this giant high risk, high reward, but canceling the teleport can actually put you in a position where, you know, like right there, he dedicates the teleport by itself. I imagine actually that, that was a cancel that didn't come out because if he was dedicated to that one hit, he would have amplified it for the combo. Well, there is a little bit of a mix up there, right there. It looks like Waz was waiting for the amplification to punish it at the normal time. So it's kind of like, is he going to cancel? Is he going to do it by itself? Is he going to amplify it for the second hit? And it's a little tricky. And when the, all this stuff is on the line, when everything is on the line, it, nerves will come out and nerves will get the best of you. And there's so many teleport cancels that above all else will just put Scorpion out of the corner. But there it is! Jump kick! And it's the amplified glaive into the shadow kick. Yes, please. Four hits into good damage. And now, Waz. He's going to play. This is his style. He wants to be just a jump distance. That's going to be a down four shadow kick for optimization, boys. What a round one. And Waz looking clean. And this is his style personified. Slow paced and clean as anything. Yeah, and Waz isn't really, you know, his, his zoning is so calculated, so well done that, you know, he usually doesn't give up the entire real estate. He knows when to fight back. He knows when he's got to take some risk to, to get that real estate that he's looking for. That down two perfectly sniped out of the sky. Scar needs to find another way to go in. Maybe he was baiting it out and just didn't teleport in time. Right there was a purposeful combo drop, actually, after that crushing blow, um, where he was looking for the breakaway. He was looking for Waz to use his bar, and Waz actually not spending anything in Scar, ending the combo early, taking the damage, but now Waz does still have a fighting chance, but now the tables have turned, because now Waz, he can't throw projectiles to get the life lead back, because that's a guaranteed teleport reaction by Scar, Correct. and now he's the one that has to come to him, so you know, this matchup changes drastically depending on who's got the life lead, and I love it, going in for the forward grab. And the forward grab, Scar looking better here, but hold on, the jump in, like you said, forced to go in, doesn't have the life lead, and a great use of that zoning tool right there, because Scar was getting up, and what a cancel they're going to throw no matter what. Escape failed too, uh, so the next back grab that Scorpion does, I believe, should be a crushing blow. Oh, no down to Antia this time, Wild has normally been really good on those. As the throw escapes cancel. Right, he's gonna confirm into fatal blow! It's not gonna kill, but now he's got a great position. And look, 18 seconds on the clock. The time is gonna be on his side too. Time is gonna be on his side, but both players are down to almost no health. So if Scar just finds the opening, finds the throw, finds the hit, he can take this. Now Waz can't do anything that's gonna give Scar a reaction. That full range spear. You can't answer it back! The Mitsu owns! The cancel into dedicate teleport. Hang on a minute, five seconds. He's gonna dedicate, gets the grab, but wait, Waz is weak! And there is the last minute teleport. What a read from Scar, and that's why Reborn is scary. If he had to dedicate to, like, dedicate to every teleport there, Waz would've just blocked and killed him for that. And because both players are playing so passively, he had full bar, full resources to use that. He used one of his defensive bars, then he went over the other side and amplified it. It's just back to back, and you don't know when Scorpion's coming and where. I mean, in that situation, if you're looking for like that one hit at the end of a game, cancel teleport and dedicate like right there. Waz, he's gonna be patient now because he's got the, the light lead and he can afford to be patient. When you're one hit away from death, that's a hard dedicate, man. And Scar, unfortunately being a bit too eager. Here come the plus frames, tries to challenge, gets hit by back three, stand alone. No flawless block on the back three, four, three, four. If you flawless block that, becomes minus 10 on block. And it's usually minus, uh, no, plus five, I think. Well, that is a huge risk and definitely a player like Scar has the ability to do that. And that's gonna be a punish perfectly calculated there. Keeping a Scar on the ground here. Scar not looking to jump, not looking to make any hasty decisions, wow. except that fatal blow. There was no reactions to be had there. Scar just knew Waz would press a button in any degree. In this case, it was a forward jump. Scar in the driver's seat. One grab, one grab was all he needs before I can even finish saying it. He gets exactly what we're looking for. Excellent grab there and Waz has to be patient. It's a, a crazy thing that Scar has this amazing combination of being both really methodical and calculated, but not afraid to do something just crazy reckless. And, and that fatal blow was the beginning. If he, like, he spent the entire round having his teleports punished on block, 
Now, most players would be conditioned to play safer, but Scar used that against Waz, and Waz must have been convinced, hey man, I've punished you so many times, there's no way you'll fatal blow in the situation. And it's, you know. And he did it, he did it, and a great move there at the end. Scar with that brutality, taking away the, the tech option from Waz because it taps into the brutality animation right away. So it is scary stuff, and Waz needs to be very careful of that next one. Waz was in full control. And it just slipped away because of one excellent read. Tries to whip punish and no answer back there from Scar. I think that's back two, I think, for JD. It used to be back one back in the MK9 days, but even a bit of a swap around. Yeah, there's the repositioning. Just try and go for these mix-ups. Just be unpredictable. Keep Wiles on his toes. Down two. And down two to get him out of the sky. Going over the up three, looking for the invulnerable attack, the invulnerable wake up. But instead, Waz jumping to the other side. Great way to deal with it. Great way to try to get around the, the possible up two as well. Jade's down four, goes so low to the ground, it can go under certain buttons. Yeah, Scar can't react to that one. Individual hits, jump back, punch is going to trade off, and in this case, it's going to put Waz in a good situation again. Still got the life lead. Throw escape. Throw escape and just bets it all on black. Here is Scar getting full combo punish. Left in a standing position, but doesn't want to stay on the ground. Doesn't want to block. Gets the throw. Scar can take this back. Momentum's on his side. But now the pace is calm. The players are trying to see what they can do at full screen. 10 seconds left on the clock. What's going to happen? Oh, he dedicates! No punish! Oh, the mistake! Scar! I don't think that short hop was intentional at all! But Waz, the discipline! I'm so impressed at how disciplined Waz is playing, because reborn Scorpion, especially someone in the hands of Scar, like, it's scary. And it's so unpredictable. And he's uh, he's taking about half of these grabs at this point, and he's not doing anything brash. He's not falling for these tricks. Scar remaining as unpredictable as possible. Waz is going to get a back throw now. Scar doing kind of a little bit of a the short hop to kind of just make sure, make Waz flinch, but Waz is not reacting to it. Waz is just saying, no, I'm going to play my game. I'm not going to let you bully me into giving you bad tendencies. Oh, wow. And He's going to get the shadow. Of course, he hit, he hit, he hit shadow kick, so he hit the crushing blow requirement. It's a far cry from beta. No more three shadow kicks here. Oh, the punish. Is he dead? It's going to be very close, maybe going to wiggle out of their oh, last breath wow. situation here. And Waz, smart move to go with the multiple hitting string to get past that mechanic and end it in the bolt spin. And there may be a gap in between the back 3-4-3 three, three, and then the 4 at the end, but there is no gap between back 3-4-3 three, three and staff spin. And that's exactly why Waz did that. It was bulletproof. The moment Scar blocked that back 3, like his fate was sealed. There was nothing he could do. And what a turnaround there. I was really nervous that sometimes, I know Waz isn't the kind of player that will get tilted, but that kind of like crazy fatal blow decision at the end of game one, that can really affect some players when you play so calm and collected and this one crazy decision can just throw you off your, your momentum. And momentum plays a big part here. If you lose your flow, you can sometimes lose your way. But in game number two, Waz almost played somehow even more disciplined than before. Well, I mean, he, I, I feel like Waz going into the specific matchup against a specific opponent, I don't think he was expecting this. So I think it might have just kind of thro thrown his world for, for, for a tilt there. Right, he's going to get the hit. Scar. I know some of you at home are really screaming, Scar, why don't you play Sonya? But you have to realize it is a matchup thing where this really calm, disciplined play is very good against Sonya because you know, the glow beats the energy rings. Now Sonya has to go in instead. And a Jade controls that neutral. No confirmed. Scar dropping some of these confirms, man. Those 1-1s one could be full combos, but I just don't think he believes in them. Oh, Cyrax, boys! Yeah, yes. big shout out to him. All right, looking for something here. And just goes block down, block down. Regular throw, throw escape failed, so you got to watch out for the next one. Could be a crushing blow here from Scar. Wake up, roll, scout it out. Even though it was escape failed, he went for the, uh, the version of the grab that doesn't crushing blow, because in this case, the positioning was more important than the damage, and now he's going to get knocked down. Waz is back to the corner. No anti-air. Throw escape. Good stuff. Oh, throwing the projectiles to kind of keep him safe, using that uh, offensive bar. And Scar knew that was pretty much all she wrote there in that situation, seeing the whiff and answering with the teleport. Yeah, it's going to be Scar on match point here. I believe if he wins this, he is going to be our first player in the top eight. Combo Breaker 2019, that would be so such a good result for him. Wow, the neutral jump. Hard read, but it pays off. And now Waz getting completely overwhelmed. And this was Scar's strategy. Let's just be more rushdown heavy. If Waz is being you know, a bully from far away, Let's just eliminate that problem entirely. Reborn, the cancel teleport. I mean, it's so good. There's the grab now. Scar in a great position. Gets another grab, and that's escape failed. If Waz gets grabbed one more time, 
It's gonna hurt a lot. But there we go. Full combo yeah, the corner. Grab that, that the right direction there. So it's a you know, do you tech against the forward throw? That could lead into a crushing blow. Oh, hold on, up three, Another getting through jump. it. Down one. Expects him not to commit. He was correct. As the tech cancel. Man, Waz, he's in big trouble, man. If he gets hit by a cr oh wait, the escape failed. Okay, that means wait, throw tech. That means the uh, crushing blow grab is gone. Yes. So uh slight breath of fresh air, but Waz confirm! Now, Waz, I think, might be in kill territory here with that Fatal Blow. I think he's just going to be looking for that back two or any kind of easy confirm into a lot of damage, but he just walks up and throw escape fail there by Waz, but it doesn't matter. Any throw, any hit is going to take Waz out of this winner's bracket. Doesn't get anything. Goes for the Reborn Teleport and just stops, just blocks. But here we go. Scar bullying his way in last breath, and that is all she wrote. Waz going to the loser's bracket, and Scar is the first player here in our winner's side top I actually really love the way Scar played that final, final few moments where he staggered like three different strings in a row because the moment the last breath becomes a thing, so many of those strings and those buttons there had like flawless block gaps. And you know, Waz oh, yeah. has the execution to flawless block there. So he was keeping it really simple. And th those three little staggers he did at the last second just ate up that last breath yes, easily. Yeah. But you know, Waz still in the tournament and we'll be seeing him later on trying to get it on the loser's side. But Scar, congratulations, man. I'm sure he's going to be over the moon uh, with what he was just able to achieve there. But. And here we have some replays from the last set. Again, a slower pace set, even with Scorpion's teleport ability to get next to his opponent with just the use of one defensive bar and a cancel. We still saw a lot of full screen game from both these players. Wanted to play it very patiently, didn't want to overextend, and didn't want to put, each other, or put themselves into a punishable state. Now again, the intense moment there, the brutality, because that was a brutality at the end, Waz did not have the option or the opportunity to throw tech it. So genius move there by Scar. Oh, I love those neutral jumps. I mean, it's the reward from Scorpion. There's a reason he's such a dangerous character because he's got the mix-ups, he's got the damage, but someone like Scar, who has been playing super mix-up heavy characters for as long as he has, you know, Scarlet and MK9, Sonya in Mortal Kombat X, and of course he's using the exact same kind of characters in MK11 because that, that is his his mantle. And I love that no, the, the adaptation was, let's just be more aggressive. Let's be more rush down heavy uh, in the final game. And it worked out, but. I feel like here we have two players that both of us are very familiar with. Gurr from New York City, Brooklyn. A player I've known since the Injustice One days. Uh, a player who's just gotten better and better with each NRS release as possible. And Foxy Grandpa, I mean, how far do you guys go back? I mean, we go since the very beginning for us. You know, Foxy Grandpa, a PND original. Um, and he's without question, you know, the, the strongest, or I guess the, the most legendary European Netheron player. You know, this, this guy was, I'd put him in a top three player for Mortal Kombat X back in his prime and Injustice 2, year one of Injustice 2, second place in the world championship. That's where he got that E-League hat from. Yes, <laughs> yes. Indeed. And um, you know, there is not really a Netheron game he's played that he hasn't been able to be top level in. You know, he made a name for himself in MK9. And, uh, you know, UK guys couldn't really travel that much in MK9. So he started to really make a name for himself in MKX, where the Pro League happened and he could start traveling and going to all these different majors. So he is, actually is a combo breaker champion. Uh, it was uh, 2016, I believe. It was Hayate versus Foxy in the MKX Grand Finals. And that was a fantastic Grand Finals that Toxie took, uh, Foxy took first place in. But, I mean, new game, a new set of top players. And we'll see what's going to happen here. Both these players are in winners, so they've got exceptionally far. Yes. Giris versus Cassie Cage, a matchup that both players are heavily experienced in. Giris is all about mix ups, and so is Gurr, and Foxy's about neutral. And funny enough, that's what Cassie does best. It is, and you know, you kind of see the tendencies of these players, or, you know, the way that they like to play really just it shows and it reflects in their character choices. And sometimes, you know, you have questions, uh, and players like to break away from the mold, explore other things, and try to just, you know, solidify all types of fundamentals across the board. Yeah, we've had some uh, crazy games to reach this point. Foxy was able to defeat Deoxys to be here on stream, and yesterday Gurr had that amazing match against Forever King. And they've earned their places for sure, but here we go. Foxy with the instant confirm. Breakaway use late. So again, you know, the tech about Cassie is making sure you use breakaway the moment the gunshot lands, so you don't sacrifice unnecessary damage. But Foxy, this round has been all PND at this stage. Yeah, it definitely has. Gurr trying to get something going here. Does check him there with a body splash, but does, isn't able to get anything out. Foxy, one of the best of anticipating those throws. If, he's, if it's not with a tech, it's going to be with a neutral duck with no block at all, and a big, big win punish. Now, Foxy, when he has the life lead, in this matchup, he'll purposefully block a sand trap and then use it to get just a guaranteed low gunshot check. Now, Gert, he's going to get hit again, and he's probably going to have to do something a little bit brash here. 
Sits there patiently. Confirm now. Now, this is Gyrus. We really can't count out this character. Even though Gur needs to make a comeback, this character, in many ways, needs to touch, like, what? Two, three times, and you've lost the round. It depends on if those crushing blows are ready oh, to wow. go. And the end of that string, almost nobody ever finishes it. And Gur not anticipating it. It is a high, and it just caught him off guard there. Foxy taking that first round with so much style there. That was a risky low gunshot, you know. From that range, Gyrus can actually punish it with Sand Trap. And what? She tried to down two, and actually the 1-1 one -one made it whip. I've never seen that before. But wait, we know that Foxy has the knowledge too. When he fought Deoxys yesterday, he knows that if he blocks forward two, she gets a guaranteed reversal punish nut kick, and it makes forward two one whip. Gyrus gets punished for going for that string in this matchup. Well, Gert could be, you know, anticipating that, and he's probably respecting that. I'm sure he's done his homework. Foxy using that offensive meter there to kind of just make his string safe and try to catch Ger sleeping again. Now Foxy down to no offensive meter here. If Ger gets the knockdown, he's going to be out of wake-up options. Flawless block. Now it's his turn to swing back. Doesn't commit into the uh, 1 plus 3 at the end of that 1-1-1. One, one, one. I think he's probably overhead so many times. Gyrus just uh, you know, Ger not prepared, but all right, there's the confirm. No meter there. Yeah, like you said, he's used all of his amplifiers, so he couldn't get a full combo from that. And Gur knows it. He didn't use his breakaway because there was no need. Wow. Yes. Down two. You got it. And meter management, not only of just your bars, but also your opponent's bar and meter. You got to pay attention to the cooldown. A really late throw escape there in the counter with the knee from Gur. Failed to escape there. If Foxy hits a forward four, he's going to confirm that into Fatal Blow. Okay. Guaranteed turn. What's the mix up? Gur. I assume he'll keep it simple here. Goes for the knee. Okay. Foxy trying to put on as much chip as possible, wow. and the counter throw. Foxy Grandpa taking that first game over. Gur taking the lead one to zero. Foxy actually has a fair amount of UK support in the crowd. I'm pretty sure I just heard Justin Xavier. But, you know, we've got Justin Xavier, Jinty, Dizzy TT, Euphemism, Mustard Now. Like, there's a lot of UK players here that will be cheering on their boy. Um, but Gur. He's going to take some time to reflect and think about this. Remember, guys, best of three. Like You haven't got as much time as players might be used to to adapt, and it, it's going to force them to adjust the way they, they, they think about what to do in the next match. And that's why I'm glad that restart match isn't a thing anymore, because these guys now, they need this time more than ever before. Yes, they do. It, it, there's, there's no time to adapt at all, and Gur took it there, waited. He wants to keep the stage here, and... He's just going to go back into it and realize what did he do wrong. Looks like he's getting a little bit more aggressive here right out the gate with that low sand trap here. And bullying Foxy, kind of making him think that he's going for a throw, but instead giving him those nice mids. And look at this damage, 33%, and Foxy has his back up against the wall. It's definitely a way better start than uh, Gura's had before. Foxy's going to get a grab, but he's playing more where that came from. Oh, hesitant on the anti air. Foxy gets a jump in, but there's no reward there. Blocks the overhead again. And the risk reward assessment there for Foxy has been sublime so far. Gur keeping his defensive gauge, saving it for later. The grab's going to miss. A little bit too far away. No whiff punish. And dude, that 1 1 1 is so scary, man. And now, should he's going to have to break away? Yeah, he does. And he does very late there. Not sure why Gur's not getting the timing or if he's just not reacting to it. It is a little tricky to get used to and something that you do have to lab meticulously. Oh my god, Foxy's just trying to squirm. And there it is. Down one on hit. We grab, or it's going to be a mid. And in that case, Foxy guessed wrong, but a little bit of a scrambly end of the round there. Gerd's going to come off on top. Yeah, I feel like Gerd knows the, the, the threat of Foxy. He understands how tough it is to throw Foxy. And right out the gate, he, he, he recognizes that, and he's adapting to the situation here. Oh, doesn't get that down to right read, but mis-execution there. Miscalculation of time by Gerd. I mean, if you, if you space your, your grabs, especially in that distance, the, the down two, unless you're really fast, the down two will miss. Like, it's a very odd little bit of spatial awareness, but every player needs to learn. Counter hit. That means crushing blows ticked off. Foxy dedicates. And now he's going to eat a full combo. He's going to have to break away this. There it is. And Gert slightly anticipating it there. Maybe possibly if he really did, or the hard read would have been the down two, but he wanted to keep it safe. And this looks like it's all Foxy Grandpa this round. Final round, and Foxy Grandpa is on match point. Both players shoulder to shoulder here. Who's going to hit down one first? Oh, the forward four. I mean, the nine frame forward four. It's one of the best mids in the game, but I'm eyeing up Foxy's defensive bar. He's got to be so careful here. If he gets opened up, he's put himself minus. And against Gears, that's very scary stuff indeed. And now full screen. Is he going to stand trap? No, he's not going to give Foxy what he wants. Yeah, he's hesitant. Doesn't want to take anything on block. Oh, just barely missed that. And that sand trap, it doesn't track automatically. Gyrus has to place it specifically where he wants it, close, medium, or far. That anti cross up was so clean from Gur. Foxy didn't dedicate to a jump in. And I didn't even dedicate to a jump three, perhaps would have beat that anti cross up. But with punish, full combo. He has to break away, surely. 
Surely, but doesn't want to do it. Instead, going to hold on to his bar, maybe to go for the mix-up. And that's a failed escape there by Foxy Grandpa. I'm not sure. Maybe he was just a little one Yomi level too deep. Oh, it's going to hurt. He forced to use the breakaway. He wants to stay in this. Doesn't pick him up for the Amplified Low Shot. This is, this is dangerous stuff. Catches him in the air. And he tries to wake up Fatal Blow. He panics. Gurr panicking at the last minute. And Foxy Grandpa is going to take it. The disappointment, but the acceptance coming through. Well done to Foxy Grandpa, man. Getting winner's side top eight at the first ever Mortal Kombat Pro Competition stop. You know, he needed to redeem himself after the summit. And I think he's more than done that so far. Shout out to the boy. But I have no doubt if there's one player that can get top eight on the loser side, Gurr is like right up there on the list. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we were looking at that whole list of eight players that were on the winner's side. And out of all those eight players, Gurr is the only one that wasn't at the summit. So he didn't really get that boot camp treat the mm -hmm. boot camp treatment that everyone else got. And, you know, he's showing that he can hang with them with or without the training. I mean, Gurr's always been a top player. You know, he was one of the greatest Injustice 2 players in the world. He actually won the Injustice 2 side tournament at Combo Breaker. Yes, um, he did. But I mean, like the thing about Foxy in that match was that he had to redeem himself after how I would say unfortunate the summit went for Foxy, where he looked completely lost against Gyrus, where you know, you know he knows the matchup, but it felt like he was just missing a piece of the puzzle that Gross did not. And that's why Gross was the more successful Cassie player in that tournament. Well, one of the reasons, not the only reason, of course. Um, but I think it's good that Foxy was able to both get that winner's side top eight, um, and at the same time, conquer a character that had given him, historically, uh, a little bit of trouble. So we'll be seeing Foxy later today. Gurr will be seeing later trying to get through top eight on the loser's side. And it just felt like Foxy had that patented patience. There's something about the international Mortal Kombat players where they are so disciplined. You know, we see it from Waz, and we saw it again from Foxy just now, where they seem to share very, very similar styles. And Gurr, I think, will be disappointed with some of his defensive choices. You know, even yeah. down to that wake-up fatal blow that it was never going to work. I mean, in that situation, I think maybe he thought Foxy was going to give him a little bit of respect, maybe anticipate the delay wake-up, and just kind of second-guess his button. But Foxy was on point, didn't give him any breathing room, didn't give him more than five frames after the activation of that fatal blow, and he came out the victor. Foxy kept it solid, he had the right reads. But we do have some updates, and if anyone wants to follow along at home, you guys can go to smash.gg and look for Combo Breaker Mortal Kombat oh 11. Katana Prime over Stabs, Big D over Kevo Reborn, uh, Combat over Mustard, which we saw on stream, and we also have Dizzy TT over Cusco and Forever King over Honeybee. Oh, so Honeybee, Honeybee got his big result taking out uh, Rewind 2-0. Um, but this matchup is Tweedy versus Sonic Fox. There was a lot of trash talk about the Gearus Mirror. We're not going to see it now. Obviously, this is a new tournament, new day. But um, the, su the Summit was a, a very interesting situation because, obviously, uh, Sonic Fox just talked so much trash. But if Tweedy's able to conquer Sonic Fox now and get winner side top eight, I mean, I wouldn't even think we'll see trash talk. I think it will just be the saga continuing. You know, yes. two players that are top level and uh, just looking to constantly take it over the other person. You know? But there we go, Tweedy going in with Raka. The character he made his first bit of reputation in. You know, just nap town clutch, dominating everyone with Baraka. That was like a combo video top eight. But Sonic Fox, I mean, the first champion of MK11, winning with Jackie Briggs at the summit and looking like the greatest player in the world. We'll see if Tweedy can pull off what might be a miniature upset here. He is absolutely capable of oh, doing so nice. here. Gutted and going to amplify it to go up for the juggle. Now Sonic Fox finding himself in a bad spot here. Gets the punish and hold on. Just looking for the throw and Tweety all over it. But don't let the momentum run away. Don't let Sonic Fox run away with it. The back throw for the corner positioning here. Sonic Fox going to apply his pressure. The failed escape from the throw tech here. Tweety in a bad spot right now. He needs to find the opening. He needs to get the correct hit here. Chop, chop. Nobody punishes it, but Sonic Fox punishes it. First try here in this top 24. I think Jackie in particular has a really good button for answering back Chop Chop, where you know, most characters have to wait for it. Wake up, roll it to Fatal Blow. He knows Sonic Fox is an overextend, and that's exactly what he does. Tweedy, he's lost his Fatal Blow, but he'll take that to get around all day. And look at all the corner. He's got the corner pressure if he wants, and he's got the entire screen to use Blade Spark zoning to force Sonic Fox to have to get in. Yeah, it's going to force Sonic Fox to just jump where he doesn't want to jump or just sit there. And it's all about immobilizing your opponent. And those are big boots, unfortunately, in this variation. Unless you're right next to the corner, you oh can't God. cancel into an extended combo here. But this is bad. Going to use that breakaway. No defensive bar for Sonic Fox. So that means no roll, no wake-up attacks for a very long time. 
Tweedy filling himself a little bit too much with that down to Sonic Fox. I think he's starting to realize that he's overextending just a little bit too much and he's playing into Tweedy's hands. The forward ball connects. Not much though. And yeah, does it with punish. Gets a down one. Neutral jump. Fox, the patient. Caught by the down three. Escape failed. If he gets grabbed one more time, he is dead as a doornail. The Baraka from full screen. Blade Spark. An underrated projectile. Tweedy with one bar of Amplify as well. There's the down three again. Staggers. Staggers into more staggers. And oh my god, this is looking crazy. Blade Spark. Fox in big trouble. That's a reversal counter there. Tweedy not wow. wanting to move and wanting, not wanting to just block there. And Tweedy taking that first game over Sonic Fox. This is a race to two. The pressure is on. Sonic Fox gonna go to a final character pick here. Whoever he picks, that is who he's staying with, and he's staying with Aaron Black. He says, you know what? I don't want to deal with the zoning. I want to go into a stance. I want to just throw acid and stay as far as I possibly can from Baraka. We're gonna see a drastically different matchup from one we just saw there, and it's very rare you see Sonic Fox lose even one single game as one-sided as that game was. Tweedy, he's gonna be feeling good about that one, but the battle's not over yet. Aaron Black, I mean, this is the character that Sonic Fox made himself famous with. Like Aaron Black is, in many ways, his character. An interesting choice there by Tweedy, not even trying to close the gap. Instead, just saying, you know what, I want to stay far away. He gave up a lot of real estate, and I think Sonic Fox is okay with it. He says, I'll walk you down with some acid. That's no problem at all, but big jump in with the boots, the double boots, and gets the back throw, buys himself a lot of real estate. What are the odds that we went back to the same stage, but on a different stage here at Combo Breaker? <laughs> it's almost like it was meant to be. Tweedy with the uh, really crazy good patience and Sonic Fox, it's it's risky to try and anti-air Baraka's jump three because his jump three is one of the best jump ins in the game. It's hard to anti-air, very plus, and even on hit, combo into a forward four. Baraka's jumping game is one of the more dangerous ones. Chop, chop, and no one punish not the, the same jump. character, you see, so he can't get the guaranteed punish that Jackie would otherwise get. Escape failed Baraka. Uh, he's got that really weird thing where you can get two crushing blow grabs in a row. Oh no! And Fox must have expected the grab! Yes, he's Tweedy is playing around the fear that Sonic Fox has of the crushing blow and the wake up up three. Wow. Let's keep it simple. Tweedy on match point here, ready to take it over Sonic Fox. This is absolutely insane. Tweedy's on a dominant match point. This will be a historical moment. The flawless block on the dash. The slow punish on Sonic Fox. Tweedy not amplifying it. And Fox, I wonder if he's waiting for it. But he did wait for the up three. And he's going to be correct on the read. Tweedy now on the back foot. The throw escape, but he's still in the acid. A little bit of damage was done there. Amplify. Yep, of course. No meter now for Sonic Fox. And Tweedy has got somewhat of a lifeline here. If he catches an opening. Wow! The anti air standing one. You rarely see that against Baraka. The neutral jumps to answer back. Does Sonic Fox break away? Surely he has to. He has to deny momentum here. No, he doesn't. He's want to hold on to it. He wants to keep the wake up option because he knows once Tweedy gets his momentum going, it's going to be bad news and it's going to lead into a throw crushing blow. And Sonic Fox wants nothing to do with it, canceling to make it safe. And the fatal blow, he does get it back oh in God. 10 seconds. If that didn't happen, he would have been able to cancel right there in that situation. But unfortunate for Tweedy in a bad spot here. And Sonic Fox looking like he's going to take it and he does with a down two anti air. Tweedy pretty much had to jump in that situation because the acid was behind him. If he blocked anything, he would have got pushed into it with punish. And because he didn't use breakaway earlier, Fox now has the lifeline. It's going to pay off. But wait, did he get grab? All right, no crushing blow. I see. I see. No, no crushing blow. Now, I couldn't remember if he'd attacked a grab earlier, but 50% down. Fox almost losing half of his life here. He's going to get a grab. He's going to go full screen. It's where he wants to be. No gunshot now to get rid of it. Be patient! The increased range! Thank you, Marauder! He's gonna do max damage. Are we gonna see a crushing blow? Yes, yes we, we will! Are. Damage over time armor! Are we gonna see Fox in the loser's bracket? Oh, yes we are! And that is it! Chop Chop for the win! And Tweedy cannot believe it! Punching the ground with excitement! He took it over Sonic Fox! A decisive 2-0! Sonic Fox did fight back, did get some rounds, but Tweedy, well calculated. What a victory, well deserved. You can see how much that's gonna to mean to Tweedy, man. He needed this result. He's now gonna be winner's side top eight. And, oh my word, in many ways, destroying Sonic Fox 2-0. There was one round there. That's, that's one round? You never see that happen, but Definitely. Tweedy clearly had done his homework. And the big thing was the fearlessness. Like, so few players can play against Sonic Fox and make him look like he is just another player. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. So many players, when they play Sonic Fox in a tournament yes, level, yes, they, I agree. They, they realize they're against Fox and they don't play like themselves. And Fox, I mean, he's a god, right? So he's always going to play at his best. Tweedy just, this is the best I had ever seen Tweedy play Baraka. 
And the fact that it was against Sonic Fox says great things for how well we might see Tweedy do later today. This was a phenomenal result for him. It was. It was. It definitely was. He forced Sonic Fox off of Jackie Briggs, the character. I feel like I've been seeing him play the most this weekend. And instead, he said, you know what? Not playing any games. But it all came down to the perfect reads from Tweedy. The acid was up. Sonic Fox said, you know what? He's not going to jump in this situation. I'm going to just try to counter these projectiles. And Tweedy goes in perfectly with the jump. And as you can see, it means so much to him. He just cannot contain all the excitement within himself. And Tweedy going to be the second player to move on. I mean, that was an absolute masterclass in Marauder. Not only the damage and the combo damage that we see, but I've never seen a Baraka player use the increased range. You know, I mean, that's, for those that don't know, Baraka gets that increased range on his blades. It's yes. an ability that only Marauder has. No one uses that like Tweedy. Tonic Fox was playing footsies against the wrong version of Baraka. He was trying to trip guard. He was trying to stay just out of jump range. And that little increased range on the jump-ins were catching him all the time. And well, we could talk about that match for hours, but up next we have just as much of a good one. Samij, Noble Samij versus Panda Global Hayate. It's going to be a battle of patience. It's going to be Aaron Black versus Katana. Yes, yeah, Samij off fresh from that exhibition last night, winning it, taking it home for Florida, and just it, it, being the hero of his home state. And he's going up against the invader, Hayate from Montreal, Canada. And, and Hayate, again, it, we're, I've mostly just seen Aaron Black from him this weekend. I, I don't see him going anywhere else. He, for the most part, likes to stay loyal to the, any character he's playing in, in almost any game he touches. It's going to be hard to call how we think this one's going to go. I mean, these are two of the more famously patient players in the scene. And uh, I think I, I keep saying that, right, patient players, but... It's no coincidence that players that are known for having really strong fundamentals, really strong neutral, it's no surprise they are the ones that are here in the bracket this late on, you know, because Mortal Kombat 11 is a game that rewards patience. It's a game that rewards calculated, calm plays. Um, but also the ability to go, nah, mate, fatal blow. <laughs> <You know? laughs> fatal blow, hey, you give but, me uh, yeah. five, if you give me five frames of breathing room, that's going to be an option. Oh, my armor, boys. armor, armor. And some of these fatal blows are insane. Aaron Black's going full screen, hitting multiple times. Cabal going to the other side, hitting full screen. It, it, you always have to be on the lookout for it, and you have to play so differently once fatal blow comes into the picture. It's a comeback mechanic. But it is a finite resource that you only get once per match. As long as it connects, it will never come back. Okay, so it's going to be Aaron Black looking a little bit mad max up in here versus Katana. Uh, Samij now, without question, the best Katana in the world. Like, he has more than proved that at this, this point. But this is one thing, Hayate, this is the big thing that separates Hayate and Sonic Fox as Aaron Black players is Hayate is way more distance heavy, like significantly more. And the acid, I don't think any Aaron Black players use the acid the way he does. Like, it's, he is so heavily content with just pushing you into it. He has the life lead so far. Samij understanding that, hey man, I've got to just get in. I have to not deal with that acid game at all because the more damage you take on the way in, the lower chance you have for those like last health little scrambles where if you're a few little bits of health missing, well, the acid's sort of that. Yes, exactly. And you just don't want to stay on there. It just adds so much so quickly. And that acid is only, is only going to hurt Aaron Black's opponent. It does not hurt himself, so he never has to worry about it. The sweep getting almost punished here, but I guess it was just Samija's turn to keep swinging and Hayate not looking like the player that we normally see here, not in control, and he's got his back up against the wall. A bad look for him right now. I said this all day yesterday that Samij has the greatest knowledge of when to neutral jump. I mean, I know that's a combination of Katana's jump two being a phenomenally good button, but also, if he makes that hard read that you're gonna do something a neutral jump works against. I mean, this guy played Catwoman for two years, of course he knows. Um, but it's just his knowledge of when to jump. If you play Katana, it is grounded, it is simple, it's very, very combo string heavy, and it's very hit confirm heavy. Um, oh, and almost knew the right spot yeah, yeah, there. Sure. He's ready for it. And wow, instant flawless block. Samiz with the knowledge. The breakaway has been used by Hayate. No defensive bar left. So now if he gets opened up in the corner, he's in big trouble. Samiz going to keep it nice and simple. Check him with the fans. And Hayate finally establishing some range, pulling out the rifle at the worst time. And you know what he talked about? He knows when to jump. Whoa. Perfect Asking jump in. your shall receive, <laughs> man. Crushing blow as well. Perfect jump, and it was kind of like he played perfectly to the acid. Hayate so sure that Samij was going to get caught like a deer in headlights on top of the acid, but instead Samij going to the other side and just jumping right in, taking this first game over Hayate. It's just the, the one thing that makes Samij such a god at Netherrealm games is he knows how you want to move. Even down to that last play, the instant jump too, because he knows Hayate is weak, he's one hit left, and from the range they are at, 
wake up jump is a very attractive option. So the instant jump two was just, look mate, let's just go into game number two. I know what we're gonna do. And he did exactly what Samij wanted. That's very dangerous stuff though, because if Aaron Black in the hands of Ayate can make the comeback, Patient play here, amplifying the stance to just keep him away, keeping him on the acid and using those preloaded bullets. It's quite scary though, because Hayate is getting, giving himself a life lead, but it did cost all of his amplify to do it, so he has to wait for the gauge to come back. And that's why he's being more patient. He has to patiently wait for the option to send Samiji full screen again, but while he waits for the meter to come back, he's in a pretty unfortunate position and instant jump one. Samiji making the top read. If you catch that jump one fan at the right height, too, she can convert into a, at the very least, I think a square wave, but jump kick or the hover. Hayate almost punished for that, but not quite. And now it's going to be just a deep jump kick. Samij constantly taking his turn, and there's the neutral jump once again. Hayate feeling like, man, I can't move against this guy. I can't move, and you don't want to overextend here because those jump-ins are so active, and they lead into full combos, especially in the hands of Samij with just reactions, the craziest, the best reactions I've ever seen, and impeccable execution. Samij on match point here. Game point, oh set point. God. Almost like... Nine out of ten jumps Samij has done in this set has been bang on. I mean, he's looking like the complete animal we know him for. Just the knowledge. The knowledge of when to go for the buttons, when to go for the jumps. I know that sounds really vague and specific, but that really is Samij's gameplay. Yes, it is. And that sweep there and by... Oh, my oh God, no! Again. Neutral jump, that's it. That's really what it mattered. That's where it came down to. One bad decision here could be the end for Hayate Samij jumping into the corner himself, but making sure he buys a little bit of wiggle room because you're going to need it for the spacing game, for the footsies game. The down four. Hayate, this is it. This is do or die. you got to make the right decisions. Backing off, looking for the neutral jump. And, and the uh, overhead. He's in danger now. He's only got one bar of defense left for the last breath. Doesn't even need to come out. That was 100% the Samiz show. And now Samiz is going to be top eight as well. And I believe that should be our four winner side matches decided. We're going to transition into loser's bracket. Well, no doubt we'll see Hayate again. We're definitely going to see Sonic Fox again and uh, the rest of the players that haven't quite made it in winners. But don't worry, there are plenty of top level players left in this tournament looking for the four spots that we have for the top eight loser's side. And I mean, like that's to me is uh, a bit of a foreshadowing for some of the crazy matches to expect. Sure. Like it, there's not even much to talk about there because Hayate simply couldn't do anything. He couldn't get started. I saw a man who was just desperately trying to get started, trying different options, and Samij just perfectly countering them. And as we see here on the replay on the screen for you guys, Samij making work with those neutral jumps. I feel like if you go back and count how much damage was the result of a perfectly a perfect jump in, whether I think that it's might a neutral be every jump replay, or replay, right? Yeah, every replay is going to be Samij starting a long combo after a jump in, a neutral jump, and Hayate just couldn't get a read on him. He couldn't get him to stay on the ground. I mean, yes, and that's it every time. And um, it, th that's the thing about Samij is that his gameplay is ridiculously simple on face value. But there are it, the only reason it works so well, and the reason not any player can do this, is because Samij has this crazy experience against all the players in this competition. To play that way and to know when to jump and to know when to press buttons and to when to, you know, go for a crazy mid if they think you're going to grab or something like that. You can only do that if you're familiar with how each player you're against approaches the game, you know. Because yeah, that's the only players, way you can. They'll, they'll mash or they'll jump or whatever. And Samiz just has years of experience. But next match, loser's territory armor. Yes, this is loser's territory. So this is the players that have lost in the winner's bracket and they're down to their final life. So the winner of this will not move on to the rest of the tournament. They will, uh, I'm sorry, the loser of this will be eliminated from the tournament and the winner of this has the luxury of playing against Sonic Fox for that loser's top eight spot. So this is a grim spot to be in because Sonic Fox was not expected to fall into the loser's bracket, if at all, during this tournament. But I mean, look, not even top eight, and that's where Sonic Fox is, is going in. But you can never count Sonic Fox out. He's won MKX at EVO from the loser's bracket. He can do it again uh, here at Combo Break. Fox has won many tournaments in the loser's bracket, and that's one of the things that makes him such a legendary player because losers' runs in top eight are scary. Now, is Bio gonna go Kano here? I'm very interested to see. He is the last remaining Kano in this tournament. Now Mustard's in the crowd. Oh, no. um, you know Mustard's gonna be, it's hard for him to cheer, right? Because he wants to represent the Kano nation. Nice <laughs> bit of Tucker. But at the same time, Dizzy TT, 
the upcoming young blood from the UK, 17 years of age. He was 15 when he started competing in uh, Injustice 2, traveling at that age to American tournaments to test his metal and get used to the tournament environment. Now in MK11, he's a little bit older, but come on, man, he's still 17. That's um, young, that is, is young. He's so more experienced than most players that age, it's ridiculous. But Biohazard, I mean, he made a name for himself in Injustice, the greatest Bane player in the world for both Injustice games. And Kano, he's really, was not sold on Kano at first, but talking to Mustard and kind of working out the character a little bit, he decides that, you know what, Kano works. And he plays around the command grab more than anyone. Yes, he does. And, you know, it's so hard to kind of find that finite balance between, you know, what's too good or what's not good enough with, with the command grabs. And I think, you know, Kano can do it if you have the patience that you will see what Bio oh has my a God. perfectly flawless block there going with the up two, extending it for a lot of damage here, catching Dizzy Block in there, getting that command grab to connect. Now, here's the throw counter, perfectly executed here by Dizzy. Flawless blocking jump-ins is, in many ways, like, that's the next level strat. We're starting to see it a little bit at this level of competition. Really good jump threes that you can't add here. Flawless block up two is the solution to that, but you've got to have a fast up two for it to work out properly. Delayed wake up into a full whiff punish. Should amplify here to keep him full screen, and now you can just zone out Kano here. I personally speculate, I do think this is a rough matchup for Kano. I think that Sonya has the tools to beat him. Kano's floaty jump does not help the situation at all. And her buttons are fast and good to disrespect Kano's offense. Yeah, and Kano always pretty much wants to be in that full screen. I'm sorry, right next to his opponent. Doesn't want to be in the full screen position. Even though he normally does have a pretty good projectile in this matchup, Sonya can easily contest. And the knowledge again! The flawless block. That's so sick, man. My man has studied this matchup. The up two does reach there from Kano, and you do have to have two bars ready to go in order to execute that move. So it's not to be always oh, hit. counter hit in Siguri here, and she's going to be bleeding a little bit of damage over time. Is it going to be enough? Just, oh, this is last breath territory here, but he doesn't have any defensive bars at all. He just needs to touch him, and there it is, a down Kano ball. Biohazard tying it up. He wants this first game. That was an excellent round for Bio because he's basically sending a message to Dizzy that he's got the knowledge. He knows the Sonya matchup. And if you're a Kano player, you know, you need to know those nitty gritty details. And the flawless blocks are already coming through. Here we go. Fakes the wake up roll. He's going to get a punish here. 1 1 forward 2. Not as easy as it looks. That's actually a pretty tricky BNB. And Biohazard doing it like nothing, recognizing the whiff normal there. It goes for the down Kano ball. Risky stuff, but it not a risk if you can see it and know it's going to connect. The back three, a great mid, great range, but a little negative on block, and that might be over for Dizzy in the oh, first game, wow. and it is the command grab, catching him blocking, catching him too scared to press buttons, catching him too scared to jump out of the way. Now, you know why I speculated this was a rough matchup for Kano? Because the neutral. Sonya plays the neutral against him so well, but what's Bio known for? Getting point blank and mixing that ass, and that's exactly what we just saw there, to be honest. It's... Ultimately, he was playing neutral for like a tiny little bit of time, and then the rest of those rounds was point blank, of which Bio was making perfect reads. I loved his flawless block defense, both on the jump in three and on the amplified energy ring. I mean, that was clean as hell. And those flawless blocks guaranteed point blank pressure, where Bio just outplayed 100%. No, he did. He recognized it. He knew it was his opportunity for the opening. And it's not really one of those things where it's one of the few mechanics that you can not leave up to guessing. I mean, in that situation, what can you do? You're forced to recover there, the recovery animation from the energy ring. So all you can do is get punished and hope that Biohazard's execution is not on point. So now Dizzy going to be second guessing himself every time he wants to do those energy rings with Kano right next to her. Now jump three into an immediate command. Grab the neutral jump and wake up though. Dizzy knows Biohazard's going to try and press the advantage because it was the up close game that was causing Dizzy so much issues before. The wake up up three, sealing his turn. And now he's going to enforce the plus frames into the command grab. Dizzy whiffing the back one forward, but talking of whiffs, that could have been way more significant. A down three is going to be it. Signs of potential nerves actually from Dizzy, not punishing optimally this late in the competition. Not punishing that Kano ball, enhanced there, or amplified there, getting tripped up by that forward three. A great move to get you from point A to point B, but very risky stuff either way. Great confirmed there by Biohazard in the up three. Dizzy stealing his turn back and making sure he, this is his round with that fatal blow. That was a good choice. He really had nothing else he could do that would damage it properly. And, you know, ultimately, let's use the Fatal Blow. Let's get the easy confirm. As you can see there, the breakaway was a possibility too. So Fatal Blow would have crushed that at the same time. It really was the best choice. And Biohazard, 
making that round work still. I mean, I know he lost it, but I'm so impressed at how he is playing this matchup. I've never seen it played this way before, and I'm thoroughly impressed. All right, there's the knockdown, Dizzy going in. And there's the grab. If Firehazard's looking for his flawless blocks, he's going to be open to those grabs. Very vulnerable. Uh-oh. Oh, there's a big energy rain keeping him in the corner. Dizzy doing a great job, but you know what? He's trying to end it here, and again, up close. You want to just second guess that decision. I feel like he was testing Biohazard to see if he could do it every time. Biohazard showed he could, and the brutality, the head oh. just ripping off the spine here, and Sonya getting up like nothing. Striking a pose for everyone at home. Dizzy tying it up one to one here, saying that he can make the adjustment. He knew what he did wrong, and I feel like that game with Dizzy winning was a lot faster than the one with Biohazard winning. Yeah, they've been two pretty fast games, but the second round adjustment was more the fact that Dizzy, I think, was trying to kind of force his hand. He was trying to strong arm the point blank, and that's actually where it was all going wrong for him. And I think he got a little bit of the extra information. Um, he definitely went into game one not knowing just how ready Bio was for those matchup changing flawless blocks. And game number two, I think he knew, okay, well, clearly I overextended in game one. I didn't even realize I was until I was punished for it. So game number two, played it a little bit safer. Game number three, I don't know, man. Now Bio's got the adaptation too. You know, he got a little bit of knowledge from game two. Whether you win or lose, you're still gonna get important knowledge here. And more grabs, we're gonna see more grabs, I think, because Sonya's back one is one of the strongest mids, leading to that true 50-50. Yeah, you really got to guess on whether she's going to cancel into those lows or go in with the regular overhead launcher, and either way, it's going to hurt. There's the knockdown. Confirmed back one four. All you can get from this range, and now Dizzy just keeping him as far away as possible. Keep that mid screen. Don't give Bio the corner game. And again, you have to respect the mid, and the moment you respect the mid, you eat back one for breakfast all day if you're trying to neutral duck. Oh, Biohazard dressfully trying to get in there with that forward three here, but Dizzy ready, ready to block and ready to take his turn back, ready to keep the momentum. Energy rings, chip avoided there, last breath situation, and it doesn't matter. He knew blocking was not going to be an option, so he tried to force his hand. Dizzy on game and match set point. We are going back into that full screen, and this is where Kano really has to play Sonya's game the entire time. The energy ring zoning is something that Knife can't really do much about. You know, the Knife will simply lose the trade war there, both recovery and damage. And the moment you're having to sit there and be patient because you're trying to work your way in, she'll just go for her excellent forward movement and then throw in a couple of cheeky dashes, a couple of cheeky grabs. There's the flawless block. Three for three. Biohazard has been on the execution there. Not easy to do, but I respect it. Guess it's wrong on the 50-50. Blocks it correctly, but not dedicating. He... Staggering it now. We're using it yes. against him. Yes, he was looking for it there, letting go a block because you do need to do that in order to flawless block. You have to flawless block pretty much as late as possible in order to execute it perfectly. Getting checked with that down three and taking his turn back. Gonna cash in here, gonna use the amplified sweet chin music. Fatal to... blow though. Oh, yeah, we're here. Oh no! I think he was looking for it. Drone drop, just to get some guaranteed chip here. Bio. He can afford to absorb one more. Oh, he can't anymore. I think even if he tries to fatal blow, the armor will lose. No tick! That was a 50 50. Gets the down one. No tick again! The fatal, fatal blow! Not enough! Gets the tick throw. It's gonna hurt, but it's not gonna be enough. Jump in, he needs one more good decision, and he whips the command grab. The wake up, down three from Dizzy, and we're gonna end it with a fatal as Biohazard is eliminated from the tournament. Dizzy will move on to face Sonic Fox for that top eight spot. Now, Dizzy has a huge opportunity here. I know it's a tough hill to climb, but if he can deny Sonic Fox entry to this top eight, he will go down in history as one of the strongest players here for Mortal Kombat 11. That was a crazy match, but you know I got to say props to Bio, man, taking Kano as far as he possibly could in this tournament. It's, uh, I truly think he drew he drew a little bit of a short straw having to fight Sonya. The fact Tough. he won that first game by showing like that next level matchup knowledge that you know I know Mustard really well, and I don't even know if Mustard knew about that flawless block and the energy ring, so he's going to be able to have that knowledge as well. That's true. That's the thing true. they've been exchanging tech together all the time, <laughs> and it's, it's really nice to see you know the, the sort of players stick it together. Um, but, you know, Bio was the Kano of the tournament, and I think his gameplay proved it. That game number one was absolutely phenomenal um, and really inspiring. Like, Biohazard always is a very, like, inspiring player because he uses characters that he wants, and I'm not saying he ignores the tier list, but he is not afraid to go against the grain. And all you players out there, man, if you're looking for those characters and people are telling you, hey, man, don't play this character, they're no good. I mean, we just saw Biohazard get into top 24 with a, a character that so many people said was you know one of the worst in the game. We had two Kanos in top 24, thanks to Mustard and Biohazard. That's true, um, that's true. And I feel like they were the only Kano mains in this entire tournament, and uh, they Bio did will well. Come back. He'll come back stronger, I have no doubt. We'll see him again. Forever King, 
And Infinity in the crowd shouts to those guys, man. One of the cutest FGC couples in the world, without a doubt. And both the strong UK competitors, crew. nonetheless. We have euphemism there. A lot of familiar faces if you guys have been following the NRS scene. And a lot of new faces always welcomed here. But if you guys want to make sure you're up to date on everything esports related in the NRS scene, make sure on Twitter you follow NRS Esports, your one-stop shop for everything. NRS Esports, find out about all the new tournaments, what tournaments you can attend, online, offline, and much more. So if you're not Ooh, following, whoa, here we go. Get Florida that. battle right here. Florida boys, as uh, KP loves to say, but here he's going to be going up against Big D, and the winner of this will move on to fight Wazinator, or just Waz now, I guess. But these guys are very familiar with each other's play styles. They've been playing NRS games for a very long time very long time and right now the pressure is on the crowd is out here at combo breaker you know what's crazy all three of the the potential people in the bracket that we're about to see both kp i say all kp uh, big d and waz all three of them play jade a lot of green a there's, a, of there's green, a potential uh, here to see uh, maybe a jade mirror later because i know that <laughs> the, the big win waz had actually he defeated dragon yesterday yes and dragon is a, Clearly one of the best Cetrion players out there. So Indeed. And uh, so I wonder if that means Big D. You know, if that were to happen, maybe he'll go Jade. It's going to be a mirror. Will it be a mirror between KP and Waz? Who knows? But they've got to get there first. It's going to be Jade and Cetrion. KP known for his patience and doesn't really gel well. With, even though, you know, anyways, Katana Prime. Katana's his favorite Mortal Kombat character. If you want to compete, you pick the character that fits your strength the best. And in this case, it just so happens that Katana does not fit KP as well as Jade does. Yeah, so he's just sticking it out with Jade, and I feel like he's been succeeding a lot more. Saw a lot of frustrations in his gameplay early on during MK11, but now I'm seeing a completely different player, a completely different character here. Shelling him here and going for the last hit of that string, and Big D caught with a surprise, and the low projectile, and what a punish there, rolling through, recognizing that it was his turn to swing and his turn to get a combo going. KP forced to use that breakaway, forced to use both his defensive bars and wait a very long time consistently seeing down twos miss versus grabs. They are simply too far away to connect. Even though there's a crushing blow with his name on it, you got to use the right button there. I mean, I think one, one of the things that will happen as the game progresses, I think players are going to start to adjust awareness of how far away grabs might be, because the down two doesn't always work. But that's going to be round one. KP, the Emerald Defender variation. Man, that's one of the coolest names. Oh, wow! Hit the Amplified uh, Shadow Kick, which ticks off the second Crushing Blow requirement. Hit two Shadow Kicks in a row and you will get it. Oh, Three, I guess, now. <laughs> <laughs> he would have got it anyway. Getting him out that's of a the sight. End. Yes, that's a sight. <laughs> he would have yep. got it anyway. Getting the, the pole spin there and challenging afterwards. I believe that move is not uh, punishable there, but it usually is the other opponent's time or turn to swing. I also think what that was was KP did back 3-4-3-4 three, four, three, four into the staff spin or at least beforehand, because you're looking at your turn to try and flawless one. That slows it up. Big D looking like he couldn't move at all. And a KP, uh, Jade controls the screen so much better than you might expect. And you know, you're KP and you're, you're really good with that kind of play. And I, Jade I Mirror, about this. you called it, you called it. We're going to be seeing nothing but Jade coming out the gate. Now all three of these players, all three of these Jade players, I believe, play the same variation. And that's the variation that gives you the downward projectile in the air, the up air or up into the air projectile from the ground and the low projectile from the pole. And Big D's really thinking about it. He's trying to understand what he did wrong, and he just feels so helpless with Cetrion right now in this situation. But he was able to clutch out some wins uh, and, and, and get here, get to this top 24 spot, get into the running for a top eight position here for Combo Breaker. The reason Big D is sitting there, and he's gone in with Cetrion anyway, the reason he's sitting there and he's thinking so hard, and you can see, you can see it in his face, he still hasn't decided this is a hard situation because do I go with my main character? who had a really hard time in that game, and maybe Jade does pretty well versus Cetrion, who knows? Or do I change to my other character, which is forcing the mirror match? And is Big D confident in the Jade mirror match versus KP, who mains Jade the other way around? It's a very, very hard call to make. He's dedicating to Cetrion. He has to ride the wave with her instead. And now he just needs to adjust. Confirm. Oh, I believe he has a... Has he changed variation, I think? Uh, no, he's, he's still he's still using spring cleaning here, which is the one that gives you the geyser and a lot of combo potential. I got mixed and by the colors. Yes, you did. I got he's mixed <laughs> by the colors, man. <laughs> it says spring cleaning, but I see a lot of lava. But yes, he has access to teleport and pretty much a, a great combo extender with the geyser. Can amplify it to freeze and keep you in the air and keep the combos going here. Going to the teleport right there. 
specific to this variation. And Jade just checking you over and over again with those down ones. Big D, you gotta be ready for them. And or air to air there situation. Unfortunately for Big D, he did drop his punish there. The back three, four, three, four, it's plus five by itself. But if you actually roll the point the final way, it becomes minus 10. So it is a pretty tight punish, uh, especially to this range dependent. But becomes unsafe on block, and Big D has that matchup knowledge, just couldn't apply it. All right, throw escape. A little bit of freedom. And oh, you know, KP. You a slow walk into grab. Such a common play. And KP says, no, it's mid, and we confirm it's a fatal blow. I wonder if that's always going to be nearly there. He's going to survive, I think, barely. Oh, no, oh, never mind. Oh, no. Never mind. It could have been because of the lack of the shield there. I believe KP got the big one, and Big D missed it. Uh, now, you can press X during the, uh, the, the Fatal Blow animations to either increase or decrease uh, the Fatal Blow that's happening, depending if it's happening to you or if you're the one doing it. Slamming him there with the geyser, keeping him in the corner. Big D looking a little bit better here. This is do or die. KP on a match point. Oh. Almost. I, I do not know if that move gets around the uh, glow, but I guess it doesn't matter. No Amplify, so that's one weakness that Shion has. If she has got Amplify, she, she can't really combo, but here we go. 2-1-2. Two, two. Oh. Let's get that knocked down into pressure now. A no little, flawless block. Yeah, a little hop there while he's on the ground, just to kind of, you know, make him think, what am I going to do? Am I going to go overhead? Am I going to go throw? And the roll to get out of dodge here, but I think KP going to put him back into the corner, saying, you're staying here. We're limiting your options. We're limiting everything that you can do at full screen. That one, two, four into neutral duck, the bait. And Big D took it. That's a challenge right there, and it paid off for Big D because it was it, it was it. If that was the wrong decision, KP could have wrapped it up right there in the corner with a conversion. Big D can be a little bit more brave with his key point now because KP, you know, he doesn't have the uh, fatal blow anymore. And that's the one thing to take away, the whiff punish. And perfectly timed to go around the purple stuff there. It, it just, as soon as Big D went to the other side, it went away and he met him with a projectile. Patience! Gets the amplified air projectile, and now Big D back in the fight. But this is such a hard-fought battle, man. It is, and if you're playing it, if you're looking at it from KP's perspective, he was so close from taking the entire set, and when it's just that that little bit falls in between your fingers, it's really hard to stay in there mentally, and Big D could take advantage of this situation. Oh my god, the active frames of that jump in one? What the hell? I haven't seen that before. Active for a very long time. Turns on the purple stuff to avoid all projectiles with Big D. Puts an end to it by checking him with that down one. Oh, the staggers from Big D. Oh, gets the whip punished. And now he's going to get a full combo. KP doesn't break away. Okay, breakaway's been forced. Big D in a great position. Straight up, wake up down two from out of nowhere. KP's going to get it. And the trade has got him out of the corner. What a choice. Turning it on, want to avoid the projectiles and a great challenge there by KP. He knows the gap, he knows the character, and he knows what to do, when to do it. Oh my god, the knowledge. The knowledge. All right, the glow. It's going to work out again. No whip punish from Big D. I think he was nervous. Maybe expected an amplify, actually. Dash and grab. Perfect use of those plus frames after blocking that overhead launcher. Smart move by Big D. It looks like this is his game to win, but KP can make this happen. The but timing, man. He has that mental clock. But speaking of timing, there's only 25 seconds left. KP has to make something happen. Avoid damage as much as possible. The active frames on the airborne projectile. Big D straight back in it. And that time spent in character select where he was thinking, do I change or do I think about the matchup better? Clearly, the choice wasn't just going with Setsuyo. It was, I'm picking her. What the hell do I do different? Yeah, I mean, you, you gotta look at it, you gotta look at the situation, and Big D took his time, which is what's really important, what I feel like a lot of players don't do. They just want to go back into a bad situation. Big D stood there, sat there at the character select screen and said, do I go Jade? Do I go Jade? And at the end, he was just contemplating it, weighing his pros, weighing the cons, and of course, he made the right decision to go back to Cetron because he got the win, and now we're in a final game three in this situation, and this is a loser's bracket, so the loser here will be a eliminated from the tournament. This is a very scary situation. Let's not forget, guys, this was an 800-man bracket. There has been three solid days of games to reach this point. It's been a long tournament, and these guys have fought through to nearly the end. This would be a very heartbreaking time to lose. However, Big D with the turnaround. Honestly, it's just his footsies. They just look a little bit more immaculate here. Oh, catches it. Doesn't confirm into the uh, combo, though. Just takes the knockdown, because ultimately, he has got Amplified. There's not much he can do. Yeah, no, definitely not in that situation. Oh, no punish again. Yeah, he's fighting back here. At least he is taking his turn. Maybe a little too slow there on that, uh, on that punish. Yeah, even though it's minus 10, it is 
deceivingly tricky to actually punish the move. It's a bit of a, a bit of a funky flawless block, but it does work. But yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where like the the block stun is almost non-existent. So if you're not ready, sometimes you don't believe yep. that that it worked, and you don't want to overextend because that is a bad spot if you don't flawless block. But this is coming down to the wire. Big D looking to take this fatal blow accessible from both players, and fatal blow kill territory here from anyone. Mistimed. Miss. He mistimed. Where's the clock in his head? Maybe he just maybe he referenced it wrong. Getting close to the car, that is a throw interactable. KP, the purple stuff is gone, susceptible to projectiles. Now it's back on, now Big D has to force his hand. Now 13 seconds on the clock, what's he gonna do? Is he gonna stay back? KP does have access to those boomerangs and it's really, really hard to avoid him without oh, putting hit. yourself in a bad spot. And he gets hit, Big D on match point here. He's gonna look to take the set if he wins this round. Big D, a character built around entirely projectiles and Cetrion somehow working around the glow like nobody's business. This has been a complete change of momentum and ultimately Big D I think is out patience in Katana Prime. Yeah. Patience is definitely the name of the game when it comes to this matchup. Oh, gets the escape fail. So if the next one is a forward throw, that's going to lead into a crushing blow. Now, does he play around to it and go for the back throws over and over again? Or does he just try to cash in on that 30 plus percent crushing blow? And on top of more damage, it will launch too. So it will force the breakaway out of Big D, opening up potential in the future. But he's going to confirm. Speaking of breakaway, KP is going to have to use his. And this is dangerous. He's got bar, but doesn't confirm. KP, he's in a world of hurt right now. He's got fatal blow, but will that? matter much at this point? He's going to be looking for the hit and he's going to be looking for the easy confirm into Fatal Blow. And the Ooh. flawless block again does take his turn back. Oh my word, this could be it, Big D. Just needs one more significant hit. The running grab doesn't work. The down one steals it, but wait a minute, KP, he's taking block damage here, there and everywhere. Turns it on, he has no choice. He needs to avoid these projectiles, but Big D looking to give up a little bit of real estate in exchange for some time because he doesn't want, he wants to play to the clock. He's got 20 seconds left to not lose this to Katana oh Prime God. here in the situation. Checks him with the down three, takes away the purple stuff. Here's the opening, but he back dashes right after the down two. Clean out of the sky, Katana Prime will be eliminated from this tournament and Big D moves on for that spot to fight. And I guess we're gonna see more Jade, as Big D will be facing Waz next for that. There's no smiles, no, no smiles there at all, Armor, because you know Big D and KP, they're really good friends. They go way back. I mean, they're both Florida, right? That was a team kill right there when yes, it comes it to territory. And uh, it's always, it's always sucks to to eliminate friends in tournaments, especially late on. But also the fact that this tournament isn't over for Big D. He still has to now go head-to-head -head versus Waz. So it's going to be Jade versus Cetrion again. We'll see it a little bit later. I think we did just see Dragon. Uh, almost moving towards. So I wonder if that means that uh, Dragon bested DJT. They had to face immediately first thing, but I think that was an off-stream match. And if it is Dragon, that means it's going to be Dragon versus Combat coming up. Uh, it could be. And if you guys want to follow along, you can go to smash.gg, but we do have some replays ready to go for you guys. Now that first game, all KP. All Katana Prime in control, and Big D, it looked like... It, it wasn't him. It looked like it wasn't him. He didn't know what to do. He didn't know how to play this matchup. And that's why you saw him taking his time at the character select screen. Perfect little fatal blow here to get the momentum on inside. I believe he was able to seal this round and, and, and try to, you know, get it because KP was on match point multiple times during this set. Three times to be exact because it came down to the wire here so close for KP. But Big D clutches it out, clutches out the second game and... You know, all it is is it took a little bit of patience, a little bit of thinking power, and Big D was there, ready to turn it around with the reverse 2-0. When it's a race to two, you don't have as much time to adapt. Big D understood that, understood where he went wrong against Sonic Fox, and was able to apply everything he learned against Katana Prime. Okay, so here we go into our next matchup. This is to get into... Uh not quite actually lose a side top eight, but this is uh, the privilege of fighting. Actually, we'll, we'll see who is uh, next. I might, might be Gur, I assume. It could even be Gur. Uh, yes, I believe the yes, the winner of this will face Gur for the uh, loser's top eight spot. So, Dragon reached this point with his uh, off-stream victory against DJT. Combat would have just defeated Mustard, our first game on stream. And uh, that's why they're here now. Combat known for you. I mean, Dragon, is he's going to go Cetrion. We have 100% he's going to go Cetrion, but... Who's combat going to play? Because he can play Scorpion, he can play Baraka, he can play Raiden, he can play Johnny Cage, he can play Sonya. Like he plays, I mean, almost the entire cast. But in tournament, it's hard to, to gauge. Now, if it's Cetrion, he's going Scorpion in the button check. I foresee either Scorpion or maybe even a Raiden. I think he believes more in Scorpion this late in the tournament. 
I would say Scorpion, definitely. I agree with you. Uh, and again, it's all about being able to, to be just one special move away from stopping any attempts of zoning, any attempts of playing the long game. And we all know, everybody knows, if you've done your homework against Dragon, you know he is the patient player, the well-calculated player, and the player who's not afraid to play to the clock. But looks like he's highlighting Gears. He's still thinking about it. I feel like as soon as he won that last match, he should have been thinking, who am I going to pick against Dragon? The thing about Gyrus is, <sighs> Dragon, the, even though it's said to be a, 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 bit, no, a bit of a tricky matchup for Cetrion. Oh, I don't even need to talk about that anymore because he's gone Raiden. He's betting the tournament life in the loser's bracket on Raiden, a character that is not seen to be particularly high tier, but matchup specific. Combat has been showing us all tournament that Raiden has a place in the game. Maybe not against every character, but look, he's got a good projectile. He can maybe he'll be able to outlame Cetrion. He's got decent mobility with the Superman if you, you know, make the bold play. But the teleport is going to play a huge part in this matchup, I think. I think so too. The teleport not Wait, committing to anything really instantly. Instantly, yeah, making it whiff, but a delay wake up, oh, no. throwing him for a turn here, not anticipating it and overextending there, going for the throw a little too early before Dragon actually got up. But this one's gonna hurt in the corner, crushing blow, breaking the ribs, and trying to jump over to the other side. But Dragon says, "No, I'm putting an end to it right now." Purposely jumping out into the sky and stopping any attempts of aggression. Now Raiden's advancing buttons, the forward two and the forward four, they're pretty plus on hit. So so even though if you don't want to cancel into them and take that big read, you can still force a turn with that. And there it is, the teleport, counter hit. The breakaway was forced. Storm Cell's not going to combo here, but now he's going to combo. Will he even pop fail blow? He does. Oh, yes, he and does. the breakaway was used. The meter has gone from combat, and that is such an important turn of events for Dragon here. That is a tough one now. This should be enough to kill if it's not. No, it definitely isn't. No, it's he a used lot it less. really late in the combo, so the scaling's pretty severe. Yeah, huge scaling. But both these players have no access to bar. Oh, wow! he does have access to that finite resource, the Fatal Blow. Now, if you're Dragon, it's a heartbreaker because you used your Fatal Blow, and he used his Fatal Blow, and he came out the victor in this round. So that is an awful victory or awful loss for him. Man, the way that round ended was just a, hey, man, don't disrespect me just because you're an Elder God. I'm one, two. Did you forget I was in this game? That is combat. Very, well, I don't want to jinx it now, but he's known to be a, a really sort of calculate pick. Because Johnny Cage was the character. He won the bulk of his uh, local tournaments in the combat cup. The only reason he's here in the first place. But I think if you have that play style with Cage, you can kind of apply that to Raiden as well. There's the advancing forward four. Storm Cell. Breakaway's been used as well. Doesn't end it. Keeps his turn. And there we go. Was this kick failed there? No, not quite. No, not quite. Not yet. I was trying to remember if I'd seen it before, but these guys take so many grabs, it's hard to keep count. Yeah, I mean, even if there's a failed escape, it's a good chance that there is a, a, a perfect uh, uh, throw tech that happened right after. And it just gets rid of it. Now combat. Made a comeback before, but he hasn't got the uh, Fatal Blow this time, so he's going to have to do it without it. There's the roll. And Combat's been doing so much work with that uh, wake-up roll. I mean, he's been getting, it has been making so Raiders! much headway. He thought it was going for a throw, but instead eat this nice meaty mid. I heard Raiden was useless. I heard Raiden was on sale at the Dollar Tree there as we saw Combat participating in the auction tournament. Maybe the auction tournament gave him the inspiration to it, go Raiden all the way. It could have been. It forced him to go into a tournament type situation, a tournament setting with a character where he had to play him. And he said, you know what? Maybe people don't know about Raiden. Maybe I can get around the gas. Maybe I can get around what everyone's exploiting. And Dragon is feeling the pressure right now. You can see it on his face, the desperation. This is do or die. This is the loser's bracket. The loser here will be eliminated from the tournament. I mean, all that people really know about Raiden for the most part is that you can crouch Storm Cell. That's as far as most people's matchup knowledge goes. Combat, though, he goes against the grain so many times with character picks, and it's a combination of both. Right, that's a big risk to take, but no punish. No punish. Very unlike Dragon. I mean, I, I again, did he lab against this character? Everyone says he's so bad, so why even bother getting the timing down for the punishes? Getting the timing down for that Superman on block. Tries to whip punish the uh, projectile, but combat recovering far too fast. And now, let me know, is this feed of the projectiles, right? Where Raiden, if he teleports the uh, the grounded bubble, I believe he actually should be able to get a full combo. So that's why Dragon's not going to dedicate to it too much in the neutral. Lord side. Side. Dude, the teleport is such a matchup changer. It is, and everyone talks about that orb and how punishable it is as the last hit is a high, but combat is not overextending. He's perfectly recognizing the punishes oh, and going so into again. them. It hurts. Storm uh. for so much damage here. 29% at the use of one bar. 
Now don't count out Dragon. Cetron, no, he drops the combo. That's so unfortunate, and he can't cancel. There's no gauge, unless it costs defensive bar. I can never remember. It's so weird. I don't play Raiden, so it's hard to keep track of these big Raiden details. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people just kind of let him skip under the radar, but here we go, and Justice 2 style, jumping off the interactable, going for the dive kick, and Combat is trying to run away with this, trying to upset every single person in this building, everybody watching at home saying he can take out Dragon with a low-tier character like Raiden. If we're going to see a, 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 an Elder God making top eight, Raiden wouldn't be the one I thought people were talking about. I agree 100% here, jumping in. Dragon forced to use the breakaway, doesn't have access to wake up options here. He can't access the rope, can't access the wake up, up two or three. All right, he tries to go for a wake up. I assume that might have been up two, but it was perfectly meatied by Dragon. But Court has to go into the electric fly. There's no meter for Storm Cell here. Going oh, with the gets. reversal. It hurts, it no hurts. No defensive bar. Can't escape, but he drops the end of the combo. Not really sure why. Maybe he was going for That's, an American reset. I, I think that only works if the opponent's grounded. The forward two juggles them, and then you can confirm. But Cetrion's in the air. I think the gravity's being used up, and he's just dedicating something that might not even work that well. Now he's trying to play the long game here, teleporting and using oh the bar. Never oh mind. Oh my god! As soon as I thought that, he teleports and goes right in, goes for the punish. Dragon in a bad spot here. He does have two last breaths remaining if he doesn't use those defensive bars. Neutral jump! He's able to get away, and this should be a fatal blow. He should be able to win from this. Okay, it's gonna scale a bit, but I mean, look, combat is weak as hell. This should definitely kill. It's gonna be very close. Yeah, but no, it's coming for it. me. Look at the damage that Dragon has left, and the two combos that combat's dropped. He's trying to go for the um, the back one two storm cell, but I, I I truly think because Dragon is in the air, that one extra hit of gravity has already been used. So the forward two juggle, she falls down too fast. Yeah, you really have to confirm, you know, and recognize, did you hit your opponent out of the air, or did you hit them grounding? Because you have to do the follow-up combos very differently. Okay, Dragon, straight back in it. The flawless block into the punish. Wow, the knowledge right there. I mean, I don't think anyone in this world knows Raiden better oh. than Combat right now. He's going for these big plays, though. I mean, risk reward. If she's not got meter, maybe the electric fly is not too much of a risk. He's only going to take the damage of, I mean, almost another Superman on damage anyway. So who cares? There it is. Combat. And yeah, that should be a punish anywhere on screen. That lightning strike is very unsafe. A perfect reversal punish there by Dragon, and he cost him almost 20% just for trying to poke and use projectiles from full screen. A heartbreaker there. Last chance oh here. Oh my god. Wake up, I fatal don't blow. Believe it. Now, where's it going to leave him in terms of positioning? But it doesn't matter. He always is just one teleport away from being next to you. So, Dragon's what's going to be the mix up? He's got to make a big play here. What's going to be the mix up? Looking for the overhead. Oh, no. I'm not even sure that was intentional. Either. I'm not sure, but that is what came out, the short hop into overhead. Maybe he thought Dragon was going to go for dash up anything else, but a very risky move there by Combat. You that know, was, uh, so it, many I, options. So many options of the neutral in this matchup. He can teleport over. He could have, you know, just sat there and blocked, but, you know, wake up, or I'm sorry, walk up, short hop, not sure. Dragon doing nothing was the best thing he could have done. You know, in that situation, really, even after the fatal blow, Combat was the one that needed to force the issue. Um, he was the one that couldn't be set and blocked, but he's going with Raiden again. I hate to say it, but it was those combo drops that lost it for him. That was his game to win 2-0, and unfortunately dropping the... Uh, tried to optimize a bit with the forward two juggle, and it dropped both times. I really think it was the gravity that was not on his side there, because she was airborne. All right, getting hit by all these projectiles full screen in combat. You know, not looking like the same Raiden that went into this first game in this set. And I, I'm just not seeing him getting anything started. Uh, and Dragon, you know, he's been here time and time again. He is definitely the more experienced, the veteran in this situation. So can he hold it together mentally? And he just committed to it. That was very dangerous. Combat playing outside the box right now and throwing Dragon for a whirlwind of confusion. However, the reward hasn't been too big because he <coughs> hasn't spent much meter yet. And oh, the active frames, the classic Cetrion. Watch out for the water, mate, it's still there. And I think it's starting to escape him a little bit. Yeah, there's the knowledge. Down one to Storm Cell. I think he's only going to get away with one of those. Dragon's on match point. Unfortunately for combat and his raid, it's starting to slip away a little bit. Yeah, unfortunate for him. And, you know, this is it. This is do or die. He's got to make something happen. He does cancel there at the use of his meter, his defensive meter, to just, you know, make Dragon second guess. Is he really going to go in for it, or is he going to cancel and try something a little scary there? 
And there's the punish. He was ready. Unfortunately, the teleport is no longer working out. I really respect the choice for combat, but he's being a little bit too predictable, and this neutral dragon is out reading him now. The delayed wake up, I assume that was some disrespect, but there's no seeming to be punished. There's no meter. He doesn't have to fear the storm so anymore. Going over the other side, and this time not poking because he knows the dragon is challenging it, and he's just hoping he gets there in time to not get punished. But he wants the corner positioning. Here we go. Punish into the storm cell. Forces the break away, uses it, but now. This is Combat's turn to take back the momentum if he oh, knocks him down. He's gonna kill him. There's no damage there. He's gonna finish the string, and there we go. Match point, both players. Combat! He was against the ropes for such a small time, but I know the chat, I know you guys are gonna be cheering for Raiden. We wanna see these characters do well, but Dragon has been this brick wall of defense. Oh, no throw there. Instead, just gives him a lot of buttons, but Combat does take the hit, does get hit from far, but looking again, or that teleport, and you know, it's just not working out for him. Dragon being too great oh, on the reaction. No. Heartbreaker, heartbreaker, heartbreaker I, all uh, over the place. I think that might even have been a storm cell that the autocorrect went underneath Cetrion, so he got the wrong special. Exactly. Didn't know what wow. side he was going to be on, and the, and the perfect block there, the flawless block to get the aggression, to get his uh, offensive momentum going here, but Dragon putting a stop to it with the throws. But hold on, he's not ready to lie down just yet. This is it, man, this is down to the wire. Both players trying to stay in this tournament. He tried to whip punish, but he walked into the rest of the string, the classic, oh! I don't think that's intentional when he goes for those. You can tell Combat's gonna be nervous. However, he's got that fatal blow, and he's been fantastic with it so far. Oh, oh the grab! Gets the throw. Great news for Dragon, he's gonna get full screen now. This is scary, go for the fatal blow, not all she wrote just yet, Combat still in this, can he keep his mind Wait in the minute. game? He just did it, he committed! The grab, the tech! Oh, on the last minute! He tries to press a button, but Dragon's gonna be frames faster! And that means Dragon is gonna move on, it should be top 8 loser side as well, what a result for him, and you could see just how concerned he was. Shout out to Combat Man for getting this far, he's gonna be disappointed without the top 8, but he got so far. Actually, yeah, it, it is it is upsetting, but oh, he course, came out yeah, here and proved it. But that is not top eight for Dragon just quite yet. Dragon has to get through one more opponent, and that is Gur. It is. I keep forgetting the loser side is just a little bit too before. So that means, um, oh man, what do we expect in that matchup is kind of hard to call. I mean, we should we should really, in theory, see Gyrus versus Cetrion. Um, and we've seen you know, time and time again that Dragon is really, really used to that matchup. Um, sorry about that, guys. But I mean, I know that combat is... He's, he was always known for using characters that, like, kind of like he wants to use. And we, yes, there are players yes. out there. That, oh, yeah. that the majority of the team will kind of play characters they know are considered good. But um, we do have uh, some replays for you guys to see there. Again, a great set. Who would have thought Raiden coming out of combat and being as successful as he was? I mean, I thought it was all over for Dragon at so many points throughout this set. And here he goes. This is after getting fatally blown by Dragon and just answering with one back of his own. And right there, that forward roll was doing so much for combat throughout that entire set. But you could see the adaptation for Dragon as the set went on. He was anticipating a lot more, giving him a little bit more breathing room so that he wouldn't roll out of the corner. And in fact, Dragon would either punish or keep his turn and then Combat just had to stop using it all together. And look, look how close he was to getting it, and it just wasn't enough. I mean, look, Twice you, you, in this honestly, game man, you number have two. To, you have to look at the health that was left um, in a lot of those games, the, the games that slipped from him. And the damage he lost on those two dropped combos uh, that Combat was looking at, it was the damage that Dragon had remaining. Like, ultimately, I hate to say it, but if he didn't drop those combos, I think we would have seen a 2-0 into the game matchup. Like, I, I am confident that's what we would have seen, but... I, I really think Raiden does have a place in the game. Um, it's just character specific. Not every character can fight every single character, but sometimes that's okay. You know, Raiden can fight some characters that are considered very, very top because his tool set can work well against them, especially in a two out of three setting. But our next matchup, Forever King versus Deoxys. Uh, does this mean the uh, winner of this fight's Hayate? Uh, you can check the bracket at smash.gg, so if everyone wants to follow at home, but yes, you are right. The winner of this will be fighting Hayate for that top eight losers spot. Forever King, originally from Ohio, now Florida boys. Now these guys, both in that exhibition last night, and Deoxys was on a tear, making the comeback for Texas last night and getting stopped in the final game, nine to nine against Samij. So right now, Forever King knows the potential that his opponent has, what Deoxys is capable of, and he's gotta be scared. Remember guys, check out NRS Esports on Twitter. The one-stop shop for everything competitive Mortal Kombat related.
and not just in, I said this before, but I'm going to keep saying it, because all these different programs that are going on throughout competitive MK, the Intercontinental Combat as well, one of them. We've had so many international players uh, taking part in Combo Breaker, and we'll be seeing them throughout Intercontinental Combat and all those European events and beyond taking place. And the Gearist Mirror, I can't say I'm shocked by this at all. No, I mean, we've been seeing Forever King using that character throughout this tournament, and Deoxys as well, making waves with it. How many Gears Mirrors have we seen? But it comes out, it's just a slugfest, a battle of the Titans here. And getting that back throw, slamming that anvil down on him. And then for those of you who want to follow along at home and know who is who, Forever King is going to be in the red trunks and Deoxys in the green trunks. And Forever King has the positioning. Deoxys with the up two. One of the fastest, if not the fastest, up two in this game as a wake up. You always have to anticipate it. You always have to be aware. And it doesn't help that it extends out so far away. Now Deoxys, he played this mirror yesterday against Slayer, actually, game number one before the change to Cabal came through. So if you are a Gearus player, you have to be ready for the mirror because you're going to play it a lot. Oh, yes, yes. Gears is a hot topic right now. A lot of people saying how strong he is. And a lot of it is because of the Oki situation where he leaves you after throws, after crushing blows, after hits. And speaking of crushing blows, the down two universal one air escapes or breaks away from that just to save a little bit of damage at the cost of two defensive bars here. All right, there's that forward two, one, two is going to connect again. Oh, and there you go. Reversal punish, does that mean neck chop? Yes, it does. Oh my god, that does so much. And it, we're still going to get Oki too. It really is the gift that keeps on giving. You get mad damage, and because the uh, sand trap does give you so much plus frames on hit, oh, look, the duck. That was surgical. A, that was a full commitment there. No matter what, he decided as soon as I was, got, I was getting on the ground, I am going to commit to trying to, to stop that throw from coming. Throws are high in this game, and you can avoid them and punish them. And speaking of punishes, we're going through the sand portal. Choke slam, and are we going to end it here? Goes for the breakaway. Oh, is he making this comeback? He dedicates to the mix-up. That's crazy, but he's going to get a guaranteed turn. Grab or mix. He does 1-1. One, one. i got to say, Deoxys going in for the standing one, I think, was one of the worst choices because Forever King, the down one to challenge the high, that was the perfect choice to go for. It could have been a mid. It would have won the game if it was a forward two. It would have easily won the game in that situation, but hindsight is 2020. It is a slugfest here between these guys. And Forever King looking great here at the end of this final round in game number one. The mid, 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 mid back, but he does go for the stagger and Forever King ready to take his turn back as soon as he recognized the animation stopped in its tracks. There it is. Reversal grab. Forever King now. Let me see what it is. I mean, Forever King keeps it as simple as anyone with Gearus. He, he does not need to overcomplicate things, so that's why he's got this far in the tournament. Challenging oh. it, but he jumps out of the forward two, so it can't confirm. Yeah, a little bit of a Mix drop up. there. Oh, is this going to be a crushing blow? Yes, it is. The ribs broken, smashed into the back of Gears. Body splash. Yep, takes the down one. Oh, clothesline, boys. I know that's just a regular grab, but that clothesline is so satisfying. Oh, no. Oh, oh no, the read. That was a hard read, and it did not pay off at all. Deoxys is going to take game number one here. Feeling himself there, and you know, even though that fatal blow is so useful, so in so many different situations, a great anti-air, a great just do it, a great combo extender, it is punishable. So you have to study, you have to go into the lab and understand what can I do to these fatal blows on either on whiff or on block, and how can I make my opponent pay for trying to use such a mechanic. Okay, and I think he was just baiting a wake up there from King. Josh just sat there and did nothing, but now he's going to get grabbed and. You know, we, we, in many ways, this is like a rerun, right? We, we see this mix-up all the time because it's the basic Gearus. But in the mirror match, you're guaranteed to see it off every touch. That's why the grab is optional. You know, it, 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 this is the best thing to go with. Neutral jump on prediction of a grab, I think. Yes, definitely. Didn't want to do any. Didn't want to be on the ground at all. Recognize that he was overextending there, hitting him with the jump in three, or the neutral jump three. Slamming him on the ground. And again, a gift that keeps on giving, as you just uh -oh. said earlier today. And we're going through. And this is where you're in a bad spot. When you break away and your back's up against the wall, it is tough because you have no options. The OS. Oh, I love do you that. Do that. I love that so much. Whenever you're blocked at this point, it's the extra layer, right? If somebody, if you do mids on block and he knows the opponent's going to do a down one, you can just take that timing and input a low block into an up two, and you will get a flawless block punish. It's the number one thing, and the duck, Deoxys, is reading Forever King like a book right now, and there's no breakaway. He's going to get knocked down. Optimization, boys. Ouch! 37%. 
into a guaranteed mix, grab or mid. And he's fighting his way back out, getting the momentum back on his side, challenging there with that down one, and counter poking with that throw. A great way to steal your turn back. Your opponent doesn't want to, your, your thoughtful opponent doesn't want to overextend, doesn't want to poke out with normals. So a throw, a great way to answer after blocking any down poke. Oh, oh make it a whiff! That slight walk back into the advancing mid, he knows he's going to press, and that's exactly what he did. He's got to keep it simple, but keep it effective. Jump, full combo now. That jump three, I mean, it's not going to scale very much. This one's going to hurt big time. And now he takes a turn. Will Forever King use Fatal Blow, or will he keep it simple? Yep, four, two, one, two. He would have needed Fatal Blow if that landed. Oh, throw escape here. Dashing up to check him with that down one, making sure he's not trying anything too crazy. And again, oh, no. taking advantage of those plus frames on hit. Guess that the game, boys. Right here, down to the last wire. Oh, no! Oh, there it is. The big neck chop from out of nowhere. It's kind of almost fitting. That's exactly what King tried to do to Deoxys just then. But that does mean Deoxys will be our player moving on to face Hayate uh, shortly. Yeah, and they're going to be slugging it out for that top eight spot. The, the chance to still win it. Even though you're coming from losers, you still have the opportunity to fight all the way through get to Grand Finals and reset the bracket against that person waiting in Grand Finals. So everyone's still in it, has a chance, no problem. You just got to take it one set at a time. But we've just seen on stream, right, our next matchup is going to be a bit of a mountain to climb for Dizzy TT. He's going to be facing off against Sonic Fox. We'll see that in a little bit. But, I mean, that matchup was, there's not really much to say about it besides that it was a... It was definitely a Gearus mirror. It was a Gearus mirror. We've seen it time and time again. But hey, everyone has their own little style. And everyone knows that the path and the pattern of the decision making, where Gearus likes to go for the throws, where he likes to go for the low overhead mix up. And no one knows it better than a Gearus main themselves. And here again, over and over again, the crushing blows. Now that does trigger every time you incorrectly block an overhead. So that's about the most useful stipulation you could ever ask for in an overhead. Looking to close it out here. Deoxys taking the lead in game number one. Game one kind of felt like a wash. Game two, a slugfest nonetheless. Look how little health he had in that situation. And here, Sonic Fox in an uncomfortable spot. A spot we're not used to seeing him in. Indeed. And that spot is in loser's bracket. Especially recently. You know, players have been dominant in NetherRealm games on launch. And Fox has always been known for being the best player in the world at a new NetherRealm game. But... You're normally so used to seeing him dominate, dominate, dominate every early tournament. But we just saw Sonic Fox versus Tweedy in winners, and Tweedy made him look easy. And you never see that. And I am honestly shocked that I'm saying these words, honestly, because no it's the last thing it. we expected in Mortal Kombat 11. But he's not out. He has to face Dizzy TT, you know, the UK up and comer who is looking so good today. Um, but this matchup is. Hard to call. I mean, I think Fox is the favorite. I think 100% of people will say that Fox is the favorite here, but this is nervous times. Sonic Fox isn't known to get crazy nervous, but best of three, loser's bracket. You know he's disappointed already. He's not getting the winner's side. This is do or die for him, and will that have an effect? It could have an effect, but I feel like if Sonic Fox just breaks it in that top eight. Now, once we go into the top eight, Later today, the matches there will no longer be first to two. They're going to be first to three. And Sonic Fox is the player who loves to adapt, loves to take his time. And I feel like that extra little safety net is going to mean a lot to him. So last opponent in a first to two setting is Dizzy. Can Sonic Fox get through here? But I think Dizzy can do it. I think Dizzy can do it. I believe in the underdog in almost any situation. But Fox. There is no aggressive Jackie like Fox's Jackie, and he's already establishing cross frames into a grab, and this is the gameplay right here. The staggers begin. There's the neutral duck, but can't do anything about it. She moves way too far away from that whiff grab. I know that Dizzy will have experience in this matchup because of Happy Pal from France, the European Jackie that we have, but, I mean, Fox is always on a different level for most characters he plays. Here comes Dizzy, evening up the life just a little bit. Good block from Fox. That was a very dangerous uh, spot to do those rings, as we saw earlier before, that you are able to flawless block in this situation if you're up three or up two does reach. Uh, you know, that could be a bad thing for Sonya there. We actually, oh, there's the whip punish. Wonderfully placed from Sonic Fox. We've seen him lose this matchup before. Remember the summer, actually, Fox did lose in this exact matchup to uh, Scar. Scar, yes. Scar playing Sonya, but a lot yeah. has changed since then. Two weeks is a long time to grind and study matchups more and dedicates into the dash punch. Sonic Fox takes round number one here. Round 
Now Dizzy's got to fight his way out of this corner, fight his way out of this bad spot, but right there, Sonic Fox ready to go in, not give him any breathing room, not give him any time to think about how we're going to make it out of this corner. In fact, Sonic Fox wants to make sure he lives in this corner. Forward throw again and again, keeping him there. Throw escape, perfectly timed, perfectly guessed there by Dizzy. And again, speaking of guessing, speaking of knowing what your opponent's going to do, what a wash there by Sonic Fox. Dominant form and just no seriousness at all on that face. He's having a good time, it was, and, and that's where he really excels. I mean, that game pretty much went perfectly for Fox, where it, you know, he only took a little bit of damage on the way in. He only took a little bit of damage on the way in, um, and then he got Dizzy into the corner really quickly. And normally when you're backed against the wall against Sonya, it's really scary. But if Jackie's able to keep her there, Jackie has one of the scariest strike, throw, grab uh, mix-ups in the game because her mids are so confirmable. And she has so many excellent mids that just work out. But if you expect a mid, you get grabbed, and she kind of just loops that endlessly, which is exactly what we saw. It's why did he ate so many grabs here. He has to try and take this fight mid-screen, I think, but starting things with a crushing blow dash punch, I'm not sure that's the best way to start things off, but we'll see. Here comes the mix-ups. Mids and grabs, good yeah. defense from Fox. Caught by the overhead, but did he didn't commit. There's no, the tech. And if he did commit and it was blocked, that could be a really bad spot for him, especially against a player like Sonic Fox, who's gonna punish to the best of his ability. Hitting with those mids and fighting back. Here we go. I like to see this. Going over to the other side, looking for the throw, but Sonic Fox was not home. He said, I am jumping, swinging for the fences here. And he cross up down one as well. Breakaway used by Dizzy. I fear that might have been a mistake because now he's got no bar for what is probably going to be match point. Dedicates to the overhead. Hey, if he's going to die, let's just dedicate to 50 50. But the delayed wake up into down one, perfect choice for Sonic Fox, knowing that, hey, if you're going to whiff this string, all I need is a down one. Now you gotta watch out for that back two. A great mid by Jackie plays perfectly with that dash punch as people try to duck it in order to make it punishable. But then Jackie just meets you with those mids and it hurts so much. So wow. useful there, stopping any kind of aggression that Dizzy is looking to make. Escape failed. He's gonna go with the forward throw, putting what? him at full screen. That was a really smart forward grab by Sonic Fox. It was so obvious that he was going to try and reversal throw Sonya into the corner. That's exactly why Dizzy broke the wrong way. Drops the combo, but he's still got a life lead. There's the confirm. No breakaway from Fox. Here comes Dizzy now. He's going to get the side switch, I believe. Yeah, it doesn't confirm. Saves the meter. Checking back and forth with these low pokes. Down threes, down fours for days. The mid going in, staggering. And Dizzy ready to go. Dizzy wow. on the board, getting around. He's not going down without a fight to Sonic Fox. He doesn't care what odds are against him. He wants to win. This is He's on the brink of elimination. Oh, I love that knowledge, man. But there's the win punish. Dizzy catching the back one, waking up a little bit. And there's the duck. Tries to force a turn, but again, too far away. Jackie recovers way too far away when she whiffs a grab. Yeah, you have to be ready. It's almost no time at all. A lot of people just like to settle and set it for the down two. Instead, just stand up and go for a regular whiff punish. Drops the combo again, but he's still oh. got positioning. And again, Dizzy does not have an answer for this whiff, whiff grab. It just feels like Fox is always too far away, and he can't defend. There's the duck. Finally gets it a little bit earlier. Fox waiting for his turn patiently. Fox to overhead as well. And now there's the catch. One more touch and Fox is going to beat it. There's the grab. He needs something one more time. And he's going to make it top eight. And there it is. Chases down the roll. Fox is going to get top eight losers side. And there it is. Dizzy TT's tournament life for combo breaker is over. Yeah, Dizzy taking ninth out of so many competitors this weekend. Huge shout outs to him, but bigger shout outs to Sonic Fox making it into the top eight and showing everyone why he is the best. He is absolutely capable out of the four players that are in that losers bracket, he is easily the one most capable to make the comeback from losers. I think whoever was in losers and they had to fight Fox for top eight, that's always like a, oh, okay then. <laughs> um, so you know, Fox was always the favorite to win that, and I'm not surprised to see him make top eight. But, you know, I've got to give personal shout outs to Diddy TT. The UK uh, in Netherrealm is, has always done quite well, but it's always been Foxy being the player that always seems to sort of like fly the flag proud for the UK. But Dizzy, you know, he's pretty much in many ways the new generation's Foxy Grandpa. He is a young guy, 17 years of age, and he, this is his first proper like American major tournament, and it is the first American major oh, yeah. tournament for Mortal Kombat. And he gets ninth place. That is a respectable result, and I'd say 
Keep an eye on Dizzy TT because you're going to see him all over the shop and you will see him in intercontinental combat at the very least. Yeah, I feel like Dizzy, we're definitely going to see a lot of Dizzy and he's going to kind of help Foxy Grandpa lift up the pride of the UK. And, you know, because Foxy Grandpa has been doing a lot on his own. I mean, it, it's in a country that's so much smaller, you know, population-wise and scene-wise. It's, it's, it's tough, man. It's tough to go out there. But UK doing a great job. Obviously, Foxy Grandpa into that top eight on the winner's side. Dizzy only one game away. And, of course, that's one game away, and it was because Sonic Fox was in his way. Sonic Fox stopped him from getting into that top eight. It could have easily been Dizzy had it been another player. But sitting down, getting ready to take on another Jade is Big D as he takes on Australia's best player, Waz. Waz is the pride of his territory, man. Australia can be proud of him 100%, but you know he's looking for that top eight. He was one game away from top eight winner's side, lost to Scar in very, very close fashion. And now in losers. I mean, he already taken one one really excellent player in uh, this exact matchup, actually. Defeated Dragon yesterday. And now it's going to be Centurion versus Jade again, I assume. Um, but that does mean that, you know, Waz, he's knowledgeable in the matchup. He's taken out what is seen to be the strongest Centurion. And now he has to defeat Big D, who is no slouch either. Big D, you know, the greatest Nightwolf in the world eight years ago. Oh, yes. That was a long time ago. But, you know, it's been eight years since he's had Nightwolf, so now he's had to change and play different characters. Um, but this is a good match. I'm going to expect uh, good things from this one because they have conquered each other's characters before. Big D just defeated Katana Prime in the Jade matchup as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, and he's ready. He's been playing this matchup throughout the whole weekend, like you said. And the matchup that we kept seeing go to time over or very close to time over time and time again was Jade versus Cetrion. So Waz has to be feeling comfortable. He has to know that he is in a good position. So I think in this specific matchup, Waz is the, the clear favorite and Big D the underdog in this situation. I definitely think Big D is the underdog in this matchup too. I would agree with you. Um, I think... Waz has, uh, one of the big things that's helped out Waz is his early sponsorship going into MK11. Uh, he was one of the players that got into the summit, was using Noob Cyborg back then and did not gel with the character at all, but didn't have time to play anyone else and practice other characters. So the two weeks from summit and the players he played there at that caliber, he was playing Jade and loads of casuals there too. So clearly it kind of got him early and ready for Jade going into Combo Breaker. Um, and his early sponsorship, you know, the team that have sent him out here, it's, it's why he's able to get so good. And I think if, if he's able to keep attending these American events, I don't think this is going to be the first time we're seeing him in a top eight match or a, a game four top eight match. Oh, I definitely agree. The talent is there. And, you know, it, you can find those gems all over the world, you know, in you know regions and countries that aren't as developed fighting game wise fighting game scene wise it doesn't stop you especially when the game has such a great net code like it does now okay here we go it's a run back of a matchup we saw earlier today Cetrion versus Jade a game of patience patience is the word I was trying to use there and uh, I assume that's gonna be what we see again we're gonna be seeing a lot of it. Oh, Hold on! Oh, oh my! Did he just teleport right into that projectile that went behind Jade? Very scary stuff here. There we go, Waz. Forcing his turn. And the jump back glaive. This is what you're gonna see a lot of in this match. And again, there's the knowledge again. Knowing that if Cetrion cancels into a projectile-based move, the glow will actually punish it on hit. Oh, trying to get a little whiff punish there, but just didn't get anything started here. Backing up reversal dash just to get the breathing room. The down two converts into the down one, but doesn't commit to the anything else afterwards. I wasn't sure if he was ready. Yeah, jump click, uh, jump kick into Glaive. It's a dangerous tool because on block it's totally fine. You can't really challenge it. And on hit, shadow kick. Every time an airborne Glaive hits when she's in the air, you will get a shadow kick in return. It's not just the damage of a single projectile here. No way. Oh, looking for the down two, but getting stuff there before the active frames came out of that animation from the down two, using the pole to just stop the anti-air, stop the jump-ins. Oh, wow. Taking the staggers. Very slow pace. That's exactly what we expected to see. The Glaives are going to miss. There's the throw escape, though. Waz pokes him with the back two. And now the down four just to get some real estate full screen. Fatal blows in play. I wonder if we're going to see it. Risky ten. to go for the glow in this situation. Yeah, we have got 10 seconds on the clock. There's the crowd. Big D. He's going to blow the crushing blow, but it was worth it all day. Yeah, he just kind of slammed that button down. He just wanted to make sure it hurt. And Waz pretty much hanging himself out to dry there with that shadow kick. Big D knows all about the tendencies, wanting to use those, those very fast highs that are safe on block and how to get around them. All right, this round looking a little bit more like Waz so far. 
And yeah, standing one didn't quite work out. It's going to give Big D the pressure and the time to go in. Amplified, spend a bit of resources, but doesn't matter too much. Glow. Oh, almost a little too early there. Could have got hit by the Glaive again, but just perfectly timed there by Big D. I want to say that's adaptation on the fly. No one adapts better than Big D in various different situations. We saw it earlier on stream against Katana Prime, and let's see if he can do it again against Waz. That and yeah, would have been extremely chunky, and it's no wonder Big D instantly broke away. That would have been a full combo standing one or two, I think, either way, uh, into up rank, and then you get a full back three, four, three, I think. So, uh, yeah, good choice. Oh, throw a skate there. Doesn't want anything to do with it. Guessing correctly on which direction, back or forward. But this is what Waz is doing. Like, every time there's a teleport there or an airborne projectile, most players would try and press the advantage and get something. And then they'll become vulnerable to something else that Big D's trying to bait you into. Waz is not interested. He does not want to go in, ever. Hold the jump in. And now, time is on his side. He tries to add the air. He's clipped. Breakaway's a little bit too late. And now the grab. Big D might even get a life lead on this. Yes, yeah, he does. A slightly. very slight life lead here, but beats him with buttons on the wake up and Big D backing up. This is his game to win. And a little taste of victory there as he just buffers that down. And Bloss there wants nothing to do with it and just saying, Waz, I had it. I was looking at everything. I was looking at your meter. I was looking at my meter, the life bars and the time. And I have just enough time, exactly one second, to buffer this down, down, down. Too many disasters at the end there. First of all, Waz trying to anti-air the jump kick late with a down two. Normally, Jade's down two is fantastic. It's got great range, but it's a little bit slow. If you try and react late to a jump kick that's that deep, in its active frames, you're going to get hit all day, every day. And that's exactly why Big D, and also his combination of the breakaway, he should have broke the moment the jump three hit him. Yes. Because the damage he lost in the combo before he broke away, and then the time lost during the grab, that was what sealed his fate, I think. It, he should have broke away immediately. And then even the grab wouldn't have given Big D a life lead. And in this matchup specifically is always playing around the clock. Both players have to watch out, anticipate it. Now the throws, once you, you know, you can take advantage of that. Either advantage from time or advantage from getting your meter back once those throw animations begin. And uh, getting a little frisky there, trying to force a button through that amplified boulder. Didn't have the amplified for the, uh, the uh, damage. Once again, Big D. He's going to flawless block the back 3-4-3-4, three, four, three, four, but no punish. Um, at the very least, though, he's able to deny the plus frames, and, and that is the, the miniature success at the very least. You can't get anything for free. Oh, a throw escape there from Big D. Didn't want to get shoved into the corner. Teleporting to get the punish. This one's going to hurt there. And corner positioning uses the breakaway and just fights back with that kick. A very, very insane shadow kick. Risky all around. OK, the glow. Not really been working out for Waz. Big D has been playing this matchup so well, and you can tell that the match he just played against Katana Prime has just been so beneficial for him. Yeah, it was a great little appetizer for him to understand what kind of mindset, what type of momentum and pace he needs in order to stop Jade right now. Trying to run away with the life lead. That hurts. That does combo. Doesn't matter how slow it is. It's perfectly designed to keep going. 12 seconds left on the clock. What's going to happen? Fatal Blow is in play here from both players teleporting to get out of dodge there turns on the purple stuff what's it gonna be regular oh. throw in the throw tech oh my god he catches the active frames of the shimmy and there it is just like that he needed exactly that much time to fatal blow that was the only thing he could do i don't know why big d pressed the button i don't know why he let go of block there in that situation but as you guys just saw at home when the fatal blow connects time freezes it doesn't matter if it's one second or 1.52 it stops all together and that was going to be enough that was the only option but that is a finite resource you can only get one fatal blow per match so that's not going to work this time around and big d has to know that he has to know he can never be in that situation again he's gonna get the jump kick into a full combo and that was just foresight from big d he knew waz wouldn't finish that string and there's less pushback in the corner actually so i think it might even be easier to punish that string in the corner because it's the knockback that makes the minus 10 a little bit tricky okay Back to the mid screen. Big D, all his way out of the corner wonderfully. Waz stealing his turn with the up three. Yeah, the up three and fully invulnerable. And just it's a great wake up tick for an aggressive opponent here. And Big D knows he has to play this matchup aggressive. He learned that in that grueling set against Katana Prime. Walking up and just trying to get something to go and didn't anticipate the back two. Waz confirming into the shadow kick, making sure he gets as much damage as possible. 
Reversal backdash, trying to buy a little bit of room. Cetron has one of the best backdashes Whoa. in this game, and the Air Glaive does hit as a punish, but Big D wants nothing to do with it. Teleporting, getting out of there. Purple stuff is on. Projectiles will not hurt Jade while this is on, and that is going to be a punish and a round for Big D. Big D on match point here in this set. Waz on the brink of elimination. That was a wicked teleport from Big D. Because, like, Waz went, hang on a minute, I've got the glow. I have to try and get a comeback from full screen. I'm just going to throw projectiles instead. Big D sniffed that out instantly. It's all about the tendencies. It's all about the reads when it comes to fighting games. You have to know what kind of decisions your opponent's willing to make and what they do and do not know. All right, Waz, this is a scary situation. Oh, if he committed to back three, that would have... Uh, Bit of full combo punish there from Big D with punishment. But I mean, doesn't quite get the punish on the ground. Yeah, a little too slow there at the helm was Big D, but it's okay. Keeps the momentum, pressing a lot of buttons. The very late throw escape, so impressive. The reactions that you need in order to execute something like that is insane. Doesn't commit again, Big D. He's not going to be sure now whether he commits or not. Down two, wasn't quite deep enough. Setry on her. Recovery is really slow. She can't get a full combo breakaway. Had to be used. Oh no, that was worst case scenario. Big D broke away at the worst time. Yeah, a little bit of a mix uh, mis execution there. Absolutely not anything he wanted in that situation. But Waz wasn't ready to take advantage. But he is looking to take oh, wow. it. Full screen, fatal blow. You always got to watch out. You always got to know it's on deck, ready to rip, especially when Big D is down to 4% on his life bar. Not going to be enough, of course. But this is going to be the momentum that Big D's looking for. The change that he needs in this pace. He can take this. Waz needs to be careful. He needs to be aware of the threat that is Big oh, wait, D. He gets the teleport on Waz, and that's going to be Big D taking a top eight here at Combo Breaker. That final decision, the surgical teleport, and he was bang on the money. And Big D's one of our most passionate players in the scene, and you can see why. Well done, mate. Shouts to Waz for that ninth, but you know he's going to be disappointed. But one person that's not disappointed is that man on camera right now. Yeah, and you always got to be mindful. The front row is always going to be a splash zone wherever you go. And he did it. He can't believe it. He is just overwhelmed with excitement. And if you just look back at it, even in that set against KP, he thought his tournament run was over. In that set against Sonic Fox, he was tweeting. He felt like he couldn't even play. He knew that that wasn't who he was, and he knew what he had to do in the loser's bracket. He made the adjustment, not just in the game, but outside the game. Mentality is so much when you come on this stage and, and fight the best of the best. But we do have replays ready for you guys, and that grueling time over almost every single time matchup, and I love it. Down to 10 seconds, and Waz hanging himself out to dry there in that situation. Big D ducking under that shadow kick, and full combo punishing, and just... In control, man. This is this is Big D playing so well with that teleport, but Waz not a not out of it at all. Especially we are going to see oh, in a little bit. I think the fatal blow here after the low time. Yes, there he, it he, is. He didn't even press a button. He just got hit walking backwards. That's that's the unfortunate thing. But that kind of loss can uh, can tilt many a player. But not in top 16 of the biggest tournament in the world so far. No sorry. But the thing about Big D is that he always seems to. Oh, he was channeling his inner Madsen there, there by the way. Go. Shout out to the boy Madsen. Just that's Madsen 2.0, Big D. Um, but what I was going to say about Big D is that there's something about him where he always seems to sneak his way into a bracket, right? Always. He's always seeming to sneak his way into a bracket, and for some reason, some players, when they see Big D this late on, they, they don't take him as seriously as, like, a Sonic Fox. But they bloody well should, because Big D, I mean, this guy got Evo, he very well and truly snuck his way into EVO Top 8 last year with Poison Ivy and placed way higher than even he expected. He has always been a veteran for good reason. But in this matchup right now, Gur versus Dragon, Gyrus versus Cetrion, this is, I think, a guarantee for the matchup we're going to see. Yes, uh, both these players sticking with their true and tried, their tried and true mains in every situation. The mirror, not the mirror, but guys, make sure you follow NRS Esports on Twitter to stay up to date. This is your one-stop shop for everything. NRS Esports, offline, online events. See what's out there. Get to a tournament as close to you as possible. It is quite an event, and the pro competition is going to deliver time and time again. But Dragon versus Gur. Gur, sticking with Gyrus. Doesn't matter if it's a mirror. Doesn't matter if it's anything else. Dragon, sticking with Cetrion. He's OK. This is what we're going to see. And you know, I hate to say it, even though Gert is a well-established player, tremendous success in the second year of Injustice 2, 
he is truly the underdog here. The resume that Dragon has, EVO champion, E-League champion, it, it just outweighs and overshadows everything Gurr has accomplished. But Gurr is not looking to stop just yet. The one saving grace here is that it is said that Gurr um, I keep wanting to say, Killers Gurus and Gur. I'm getting tongue twisted. I'm, 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 I'm about to say, I think I am just going to call it Gurus from now on and just you know cut out the middleman entirely. But uh, the saving grace for the matchup is the fact that uh, Gurus is said to do well versus Cetrion. And it's a big part of it is because the airborne kind of move, the, the projectiles and the keep away, some of them are punishable on block if spaced incorrectly by Sandra. And in this variation of uh, Gyrus, Infinite Warden, the crushing blow makes a big deal. And then, uh, you know, she has to kind of deal with the, 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 the guessing game of Gyrus up close the same way everyone else does. So, Gur will know this matchup. I have no doubt he's going to be prepared. But Dragon plays this matchup better than anyone I've ever seen. I guess we're gonna let that intros rock. The roll heading, the roll of the head, no tech on the body. She wishes to test us both. I have already proven perfect. All right, let's see where that first strike of momentum goes. Dragon backing off, not surprised at all. Utilizing those full screen options, utilizing the zoning and the amplification there of that beam as Gur just waiting waiting for his opportunity. He doesn't have access to a teleport, but he does have access to, like you said before, those sand traps, the low sand traps that will reach anywhere on the screen. They don't track, you have to purposely place them, but Gur is one of the best at doing that. Wow, not sure what that was there. Yeah, that could have been, uh, I think that's even why Dragon didn't really whip punish it very well, because I think he didn't expect that either, honestly. That was the last button I expected. I've never seen that before. Let's see if Gur's just a little bit nervous, or maybe he's got a better plan that we don't I mean, know about. It, it had to be a down ball that he missed the input for. It had to be, surely. Um, but either way, it's not going to be his problem just yet. Now, commit. I mean, this is the unsafe stuff. This is the crazy stuff that if it works, it's great. But if not, it puts you in a horrendous position. Dragon drops the combo. There we go. Bed of spikes. Breakaway should be used now. Oh, oh. And that's a big overextension there by Gur. Dragon cashing in with the crushing blow there, making sure it pops up for a combo, and he is not going to drop it there in that situation. Dragon taking the first round. We asked if Gear was nervous. I think that confirms it. I mean, he's, he is one of the best Gears players in the world, and all right, punish. We're going to get a crushing blow here into that, guaranteed pressure. That is what a is lot of damage. Be? A lot of damage, nearly 32% right off the gate, but crushing blows happen only once per match. Gear's got to get something else out of under his sleeve. Keeps it simple, the trade. Gonna favor Gur here actually with the life lead he's currently sitting on. Escape failed. And that does mean the dragon got trip guarded and then tried to tech either direction. Keeps it a forward grab. That was a, a really smart forward grab because normally when you're like, back to the wall, it's so obvious. And again, I think he's done it again. Yeah, escape failed. That is the forward throw. So Dragon anticipating to get thrown into the corner, but instead, Gur playing to that fear, playing to that knowledge and understanding this is Dragon. He is so calculated, he would rather take the throw than get tossed into the corner. But he finds himself kind of close to the corner there. Not too much real estate, and this is what Gurr wants. I mean, a wise man once said it's more than a 50-50. And I think if you're back to the ball and you're going for a grab, that's 100% an example of that. And Gurr, fighting back. He is going to get full comboed here. No breakaway. Uh, he's going to build it now, but yeah, no reason he would. He'll save it for later. Yeah, I love the side switch there from Dragon. Always knowing where he's getting hit, where he's connecting the hits everywhere on the screen. You've got to be so calculated against Cetrion. She can punish your mistakes heavily, sending you full screen all over again, whiffing the forward 3-2, but doesn't matter. Gur survives, oh. and that could have been a whiff punish, but just too far away. Yeah, he missed the sand trap again, a little bit miscalculated wow. there. Possibly wanted to go for the medium instead, going for the far. Oh, and the air-to-air -air from Dragon! Pressing buttons even when Gur wasn't home to take them, but it's okay, Gur doing anything but blocking on his way up. He didn't even need a full combo there, okay. No crushing blow anymore because it's been used up, but he's going to get Oki guaranteed. And wow, Gur just does nothing. I, I really think there's some nerves here. I really think he's nervous. I all right, mean, Dedicate. Oh, Dedicate bets it all. Jumping in, no body splash instead. Dragon just backdashing right away. Cetrion's oh, wow. got to use it. He's got Fatal Blow in play. Dragon now has to be so careful. Dashing grab, is that enough? No, 2% left. Last breath situation. And the down one, Gur taking that first game over Dragon. And you can see the emotion. He's saying, yes, I got this. Let's go. Every time you see Gur, whether it's win or lose, you just see nothing but passion on this man's face. He wants it more than anything. He, 
you, as you could see him beating Forever King last night, he was looking at the screen over and over again it, like he couldn't believe it. Like, I did it. Yes, I did it. I want this. And here he is, one game up above Dragon in an underdog situation. You know, the crazy thing is, you're looking at Gurr and you're looking at his visual demeanor here. It is reflected in his gameplay. He's going for these bold decisions, these bold plays, a little bit overextension, a little bit nervous. And it's like his gameplay is a complete reflection of what he's like right now. And I'm not surprised. He's one of our more passionate players. He definitely has got nervous in the past. But I wonder if that game one has just given him that boost of confidence to shake it off and take what he thinks is rightfully his. A top eight at Combo Breaker, MK11. Or is Dragon going to pull it back two games straight? Jumping in and Gurr utilizing those two bars to break away right away. A bad spot here, but if he can get something going, get the animations going, again, this is just what he needs. But Dragon fighting back with a breakaway of his own, and this is going to be a forward throw, keeping him closer to the corner. Dragon needs to watch out for the throws and watch out which way he's going to attack. And that was a little risky, a little frisky from Dragon jumping over the other side. Love the side switch situation. A pro player like Dragon is going to know where he is at all times on any stage in this game. I mean, one of the benefits here is that if you're pressuring Giris in the corner, it means you're not going to deal with his nonsense. And, and that is ultimately what you have to do. Avoid the mix-up for Giris as much as possible. Avoid the 50-50. Avoid the grab-strike mix-up. Wonderful throw escape. And I think he's getting a bit wise to uh, Gurr's grabs there. Something that Dragon must have thought about during the game was, hang on a minute, how is the grab working there? Because the, the, the grabs giving him that mix-up was really ultimately why Dragon lost that round in a... Uh, First round Gurr took, but oh, oh that's gonna crushing be punished. Blow. Crushing Shop. blow. The oh. chops jam, boy. So much damage here. And oh, wow. I think he hesitated on the anti cross up. And that is gonna be a punish perfect from Dragon jumping in. He's gonna be going for the breakaway. I'm surprised Gurr went with it and didn't just wait for it because now he's going into this round with no defensive bar at all. There were two things I was surprised about that Gurr um, didn't use breakaway immediately and that Dragon didn't use his Fatal Blow. The Fatal Blow would have closed out the round for sure, and Dragon is very fortunate that the grab did work out, because if that didn't, he would have lost the round and regretted not sealing it immediately. Here comes the 1-1 confirmed bed of spikes. Breakaway's in play, so now there's the adaptation. Gurr, you see the Gearish players, when they know a breakaway's coming, they go temporal advantage and not bed of spikes, because bed of spikes is way more with punishable if they stand up. Exactly, exactly. Recovers a lot faster. You can see Gerd taking his turn right again, knowing that Cetrion had no no wake-up options in that situation as she depleted her entire defensive bar. And the composure from Dragon hasn't left himself as open. The instant jump. We've seen that so much this weekend. If you are confident they're going to jump, they are not ready for your wake-up jump ever. And there we go. Clean, clean two rounds. Dragon back in the fight. Gerd's going to have to think a little bit. The big change was that Dragon did not overextend. He let no grab get unteched, and he didn't get hit as often as he did in the first game, which obviously if you're not getting hit by Giris, you're not getting hit by the Oki, and there's no mix-up to be had. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's all momentum-based, and that's really what Gurr loves about this character, is that once he gets started, anything is possible. Now, don't think that he is going any to any other character on that screen. He's 100% going to Giris, and you know, he knows he can do this. He did it that first game. Even after that first round looked so bleak for Gurr, he was able to pick up the pieces, adapt on the fly, and play to the opponent, and playing against someone as calculated as Dragon. Sometimes when you're a little too calculated, that's when you become a little too predictable. And that's that's what Gurr's doing. And phenomenal play. Phenomenal play that I am very impressed by. So this will be the final resting place for one of our two players here now. Last game in it, Gurr versus Dragon. Hard to call this one because Dragon's adaptations, I think, have made me a bit fearful for this final game. Gurr needs to make sure that when he lands a hit, he's going to make it count. Reversal punish, immediate crushing blow. It's going to put him straight in the lead here. Straight into a decisive lead here. Almost 32% just from that one punish there from full screen. The Sand Trap and Dragon being a little bit more careful, a little bit more mindful of that option. Full screen options of his own could spell disaster for Dragon. Oh, oh my god! No capitalization either. When you see a rock from that range, you know it's normally going to be just a, a diagonal one. But I guess maybe he should have pressed and made the read. It's a little, yeah, it's a little tough there. I mean, he, he was expecting Gurr to just jump in and crushing blow, popping up for a combo extender here. Now, Gurr does have access to Fatal Blow, but it is not in kill ter ter territory just yet. So who knows if he's going to do it? No, he's not. He's not going to see the end of this round. I feel like Dragon's been able to just put a lid on it. He's been able to just keep it reserved. He's not giving Gert anything to work with. And that's why I think he plays this matchup better than any Cetrion player out there. This seems to be a bad matchup, but you'd never guess 
the way Dragon approaches it. Oh, oh wow. chucking oh all the down God, one. Another crouch. These dashing grabs, they just simply aren't working anymore. Gur's in big trouble now. His back's to the wall. He gets down one. It's going to be mixed, and he doesn't even confirm into Sand Trap. I think Gur might be a little bit antsy. Not the Gur that we know. Oh, and there's the boulder, doesn't go for the air one instead. Dragon knows Gur is playing a little too timidly in this situation. He knows he's nervous. He knows that he is not just trying to jump in willy-nilly, but there, never mind, wow. as soon as I said it, the oh, no off confirm. the top rope. No confirm, though, and he dedicates the hard 50-50, tries to really force his situation back, and even though he's going to survive this hit, this might even already be game over. He goes in for the jump, he gets a grab. Gur has to bet it all now. He can't sit full screen anymore. He's got to get in. Oh, he tries to jump out of the situation, rolling right past him, and now it's Dragon's turn to block. Holding onto this, the body splash, beautiful anticipation there, and gets the throw, and that is all she wrote. Brutality slicing him in half and ending the dream of Gur of seeing any top eight for Combo Breaker. Gur falling short here at ninth place, the worst place a player like him could possibly anticipate, but it's okay, it's over. Shakes the hand, good sportsmanship, and Dragon is going to be moving on to that top eight on the loser side later today. I think it all starts to fall apart for Garen in the last minute. The moment he got the jump in 1-1, one, one, you can tell Dragon he's happy for that first top eight. This is so important to every player left in this bracket because, you know, it's that combo breaker medal. It's the fact that you have made more Combat 11 history by being one of the first eight best yes. in the world. Yes. And Gur, I mean, you've got to feel bad for him. You know he's going to be feeling bad about it, but I mean, I think his nerves started to shine through. We know he's talented. We know he's one of the best Gears players in the world. However, when Gur gets nervous, he doesn't play like himself. He makes a couple of small mistakes that at this level of play you'll get punished so heavily for, even down to the last minute. He got a jump in 1-1, one, one, but he'd already just dedicated to the three 1-1s one, and he could have confirmed that into a full combo, and he that might even have been the round. He could have, but I think sometimes you just don't believe or you feel like it's impossible, but you always have to believe. Believe in the reads, believe in the callouts, and Gert, you saw so much passion at the end of that first game. He wanted it. You could see it on his face. If you look back at that, and Dragon making the right adaptation, understanding how to dance around the throws that Gur was just getting away with in terms of pressure and, and just putting an end to it. And here it is, the final resting place of Gur's dreams, the final resting place of Gur's tournament life as Dragon just super calculated, making sure every single punish. And even towards the end when it was down to nothing, Dragon knew. Just take the throw. I don't want to be in a fatal blow situation. I'm going to take the throw and wait for my opportunity. Dragon always the first to just sit there, wait, and block. And coming up next for you guys is Deoxys and Hayate. This is for top eight on the loser's side. This uh, this is going to be the last game as well. Uh, this, we have seven players already confirmed, and this is the final one. Deoxys and Hayate. I'm uh, Again, we're, we're going to keep saying this, but... I truly don't know how to call this one. I know it's going to be likely, it's going to likely be Giras versus Aaron Black, is what I assume. Uh, Deoxys may have seen Samij beat Hayate with Katana, but Deoxys and Samij have two different styles of Katana, and, and Deoxys's may not work as well out um, in this matchup here. But what a tournament this has been so far. It really is crazy, man. I mean, even Dragon. Like, Dragon was everyone's prediction to be winner side top eight. The fact he's in loser side top eight, you can see that's why he was even like, you know, I saw maybe a slight teary eyed Dragon there because. Yes. He, he won that top eight and getting the Luke sent to losers yesterday, that, that crushes anyone that is expecting better of themselves. It always is. And this is our final match. The young blood Deoxys, one of our younger competitors. Hayate, just one of the more consistent players in our scene. And uh, I'm expecting a damn good match here, Armour. Yes, I definitely am too. And Hayate with that patented Aaron Black, the person who's just so okay with sitting back letting that stance do whatever it needs to do and throwing up the acid almost as a mental wall to kind of play to his opponent's tendencies. And like you said before, Hayate so good at making the opponents block and just sit back on the acid. He is very patient, very calm, and very collected. Okay, so it is going to be the matchup that we expected. Giris versus Aaron Black. Guys, again, this is the final match to determine our top eight here at Combo Breaker for the Mortal Kombat Pro Competition. Follow NRS Esports, use that hashtag Pro Competition. Tell us online what you think. I can't wait to see what you guys think of the top eight later. It's gonna be ridiculous, but we've got one more match to get there. And it's gonna be Canada versus America. 
looking for that 2-1-2-1-2. Two, one, two, one, two. Uh, just a flurry of punches that leaves Aaron Black in a guessing situation where he can just kind of throw you for a whirlwind if he wants to cancel on that slide or just let the string rock. Oh, fighting back. Any advancement forward, advancement movement there by him. Going for the knee into the headbutt. And the overhead string, canceling it to make it safe and, and make sure that he can block right afterwards. Immediately, we're going to get that reversal grab, which is such a common thing about Giris, man. The grabs on block are dangerous things. Even if a move's not punishable, you open yourself up for a grab if you sit there and block it afterwards. And there's the mix-up. 1-1-1. One, one, one. He's going with the big plate early, but this time Hayate, he's going to get the launch. Drops the combo. That's really, really unfortunate, because now he may even lose the entire round for it. There's that throw escape, getting out of danger just temporarily. Instant jump one! These Injustice players and their pesky jump one at the end. And punching that sand statue of Aaron Black, just kind of foreshadowing what Deoxys is trying to do at Hayate. He's trying to end dreams here. He's trying to find himself into this top eight. He's trying to be the succeeding underdog in this situation. The boot drop into the amplified shot. You never know when they're going to do it or when they're just going to let the boot drop rock. So it's so frustrating when you get hit by that. Checking him with the down one perfectly. The throw escape. Hayate on point. The reactions are impeccable. The reactions are crazy. Overhead. Confirm. Oh, breaking away right away. Doesn't want anything to do with that damage. Anything to do with that combo. Now Hayate's got some breathing room. Going to throw acid. No, he's going to go in for the flurries. Bounce him up again. Now this time you don't have bar to air escape or to break away. Yeah, Deoxys doing what he kind of has to do in this situation. When you're one hit away from death, sometimes maybe squirming is the best thing to do. Chip avoided. No, thank you. No more last breath. No more defensive bar. Hayate turning this one round. Playing a lot better than he did in round one. That drop was the beginning of the end for him. And now he's cleaned up his execution. A flawless block there oh, by me. Oh, hold on. Get hit by down four and do standing one. That is disrespectful. That is insane. Hayate said, you know what? On hit. And how this great at confirming those down pokes, knowing that it's his turn to swing. So Deox is just kind of playing to a different tune, a tune that he's not expecting. Oh, no. This hurts over the acid so much. DOT checking him there. You have to. You can't let Aaron Black do whatever he wants. He's got the overhead. He's got the throw mix up. He's got the acid. All right, bed of spikes, guarantees a turn. It's going to be a grab this time, keeping it simple. Now the Oxus. And I mean, I keep um, how many times do I have to say it right? Strike or grab? Hayate using his last thing, and he bets wrong again. Two, three times in a row, Deoxys making the right call. The moment he got knocked down, Hayate, it was guess city. And unfortunately, three times, couldn't get it done. Unfortunate for Ayate, you know, and that's really what it is and what lets the strong characters stand out way beyond any of the other characters is the presence of mids. How many great fast mids do they have? Because you can play around the throw game, the throw mix-up, so perfect with it. Yeah, if you guys heard it, but the Texas boy is getting behind Deoxys, man. He was a star performer yesterday in the team battle and he's looking to be a star solo performer for their region today. But can he pull it off? You know, Deox is being really respectful there right after the cancels, not really trying to, to force his will in, force his buttons, instead kind of waiting for Hayate to do what Hayate does. Great anticipation of the advancement there because of the acid. It's kind of like a tell. When your opponent throws it down there, you know what he's trying to do. He's trying to keep you there in hit stun or in some kind of throw animation. And right there out the gate, the overhead, so much damage here. Hayate putting on a clinic. And there it is. He's going to get the big launch. Hayate bringing himself around on the board. Hasn't got breakaway, which is going to be scary if he gets uh, space closed in. But from this range, you always have to worry about the uh, the sand trap. And then it, you know, the sand trap on block might give Aaron Black an opportunity to then try and establish some acid. But until it comes out, you have to respect it all the way. As a Giris, he commands so much respect. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Look at all those mids. And Hayate guessing for his life here. Getting counter hit here. And it's going to hurt so much damage. Amplifying to add more to it. And Hayate forced to use the breakaway. Forced to use all his bar. What can he do now? Uh -oh. No access to wake up attacks. He's got to guess over and over again. Delay wake up. But the axe is all over it with the timing. My Perfect word. here. He's going to block the low poke, take another grab, and still no defensive bar. He's having to hold this mix up all day, every day. Tries to go for a string and just eats a jump three. Wake up jump three, challenged by a down one, blocks the 50-50, but the throw tech, good stuff from Deoxys. The flawless block into the flawless block, punished there from uh, Hayate. Crazy stuff, but he's still fine for his life. Can't take the down one, Deoxys on match point for our final top eight player. 
Yeah, getting down to that tiny little pixel, that last threat situation, so tough against Gears because that down one is so fast and it's just so oppressive here. The back throw slamming the anvil down on him and just waiting for his turn, blocking accordingly here. Oh, and this no. time, challenging it. The whole game, he's been not challenging after that situation, but right there, trying to take Keate for a whirl. Oh, that was a big wrong, drop. He goes in for the wrong sand trap. Oh no, 50-50, it's gonna be so much damage. The backbreaker, Aaron Black, is in big trouble, and so is Hayate. He's gonna get a grab, but he's got so much more work to do, Darth Armor. He does indeed, but he can do it. Getting it started here, looking for the boot drop, getting challenged again right after the sweep. Low profiling of everything, and that is it. Deox is taking it with the pride of Texas on his back. His boys on the scene, ready to support him no matter what. And again, I think the underdog in this situation, a player not present at the summit, taking it over Hayate. Deoxys, he came in late in Injustice 2, but everyone knew he was good. And uh, as a late bloomer, it's always so common that our young players make a name for themselves immediately in the next game. And that's exactly yes. what Deoxys has just done. He is one of our youngest players, and he's been able to get that top eight, the final top eight, for today. And Hayate was a hell of a name to take alongside it. Congratulations, and we'll be seeing you later on today. Commiserations for Hayate, man. He is a fan favorite, and I have no doubt we'll see him again. He is going to be a, a pretty regular top eight player, I believe, later on in the year. Yeah, I mean, you know, like you said, it was it, it was there a little bit late into Injustice 2, and I feel like even when he was succeeding, it was a lot. It was a lot of on and off. So I love seeing that he did it. This is the first stop on the Pro Competition Tour, and Deoxys did it. He did it. He is in that top eight. But we do have the bracket ready for you guys to see who solidified into the top eight. On the winner's side, we have Scar, Foxy Grandpa, Tweety, who took it over, Sonic Fox, and Samij. And then in the loser's side, it's going to be Dragon versus Big D, a Cetrion mirror. Is that what we're going to see? That's what we're going to see. I guess we'll wait and see. Deoxys versus Sonic Fox. And happy to see one British flag in there. Foxy Grandpa, the only non-American player remaining in this tournament. We'll see if he can pull it off. Him and Scar have had some legendary battles in Mortal Kombat historically, and we'll see if it follows through with MK11 as well. But what a tournament it's been so far. Thanks for joining us so far right now. We're going to be, uh, I believe at this point, we're going to be banging out because yes. we have uh, got to get prepared. And as MK11 is the main event at Combo Breaker 2019, it's going to be the last game on stream. So it's going to be a fair while, a fair few hours. Go away, share the stream out, go have something to eat. Maybe catch a nap wherever you are in the world if you're staying up like many Europeans or however I might be doing. And uh, we'll be seeing you a little bit later on. Yeah, and big thanks to Gojira for the sell off their album Magma. One of the themes for the Mortal Kombat Pro Competition stop at Combo Breaker 2019.